thanks, thanks everybody. Welcome to day four, uh, final day of the Euglena International Network Conference 2022. Uh, we've had a great few days of speakers um, and today uh, is looking to be excellent as well. Um, I, I would like to introduce the session chair um, for this, the first session today, Dr. Erin Morrison. Uh, Dr. Morrison received her PhD from Trent University here in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, uh, in the area of plant-fungal interactions, and is now a senior scientist uh, in the R&D department at Dumbleton. Erin is also an adjunct professor in the graduate faculty uh, at Trent University. So without further ado, Erin, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. And as Scott said, welcome everyone to day four, our final day of the EIN conference. And I wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers, our session chairs and moderators, as well as the organizers for putting together this conference. And for everybody who's been participating and joining in. So today's session will be focused on translation and commercialization. However, before we begin, I'm going to take a little bit of a time to review the conference um, so far, starting with our basic biology session that took place on day one, which examined synthetic biology and work done on different microalgal systems and how these techniques can be applied to euglenid analysis, as well as highlighting different hurdles which can be faced with genetic modification and how these can be addressed. On day two, we were taken into uh, the ecology and environmental application of euglenoids, looking at their presence in the environment and diversity of growth, as well as their ability and tolerance to metal uptake, and how this could be applied uh, to remediation efforts. And yesterday, uh, we examined the evolution of euglenids. And in these talks, uh, the evolutionary complexity of different endosymbiotic events was discussed. So highlighting the endosymbiotic events that took place resulting in the wide diversity of autotrophic, phagotrophic, and osmotrophic euglenids, with focus on evolutionary tracking and phylogenetic mapping of genes and gene origins of four chloroplasts, mitochondria, and other plastids. Uh, specifically identifying origins from green algae and uh, other non-algal groups. So these talks focused on the evolutionary complexity of the process by which these different organelles became integrated into a new cellular context. And we also looked at current symbiotic interactions between uh, euglenids and associated bacteria. So again, thank you to all of our speakers uh, from yesterday and from the, the prior days too for all of these stimulating uh, presentations. So today, as I mentioned, our session will be focused on translation and commercialization. And we will hear from three speakers as well as an update from the EIN and the award for best photo will be announced. So for all the participants, please feel free to write your questions in the chat uh, during the sessions. And we will go through these uh, during the panel discussion as we've been doing uh, throughout the conference. And speakers, I will send a notification uh, in the chat when you have about five minutes remaining uh, in your talk. So to start our session off today, uh, we have Dr. Uh, Kazuki Goda from the University of Tokyo who will be talking about image activated cell sorting and its application to Euglena. So Dr. Goda, please feel free to share your screen. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hello everyone, let me share my screen. Oops. Does it look okay? <clears throat> Looks good. Looks okay. Good. So, uh, so let me talk about this uh, kind of new technology uh, known as intelligent image activity cell sorting, and uh, I'll be also talking about its application to Uganda. I'm not a Uganda scientist. I'm more like a technologist who uh, develops uh, uh, new technologies based on photonics, nanotechnology, and microfluidics. And also we 
uh, my group uh, uh, exploit new applications based on the new technologies. Uh, so we focus on serendipity enabling technology to realize you know, Louis Pasteur's statement, the chance paper is a prepaid mine. So these are some of the representative uh, uh, papers from my group in the, in the past uh, 10 years or so. And I'll be talking about these couple of papers today. Um, so today I will talk about sort of engineering aspect of this uh, image activated cell sorting and how to apply it to even cells. So let me talk about the big, big picture. Uh, so cell analysis. So the many unmet needs in cell analysis, such as how to identify unknown cells and the functions, how to isolate cells with unique features and so on and so forth. And, but cell analysis is quite challenging because it's somewhat analogous to this Wes Wally or Wes Waldo uh, problem. Uh, the theme of this game is to find Wally uh, quickly with high accuracy. And the world is here. Uh, but this problem has become more and more difficult. I think the, the pre, this one is probably level two or three, but this is level 50 or something. Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult. <clears throat> and this situation is quite analogous to uh, cell analysis in biology. The world is here, by the way. So the most traditional way of uh, you know, studying cells is, is to use optical microscope with a cell picker. So you look into a microscope, you investigate individual cells one by one under a conventional microscope. And then if you find unique ones, you pick them up by pipetting. But this process is extremely time consuming, labor intensive and inefficient. Even with the automated microscope, it's still very slow. It takes uh, about one cell per second. And if you are good at it, you can win the Nobel Prize. Probably this uh, professor, Japanese professor Satoshi Omura, uh, uh, is probably the best world finder. There's an automated technology called FACTS, fluorescence activated cell, cell sorting. It counts, analyzes, and sorts cell population based on uh, light scattering and fluorescence measurements. So you basically start with a cell population, and you mix it with fluorescent level antibodies and you flow those cells. And then you excite these cells with a laser and then you detect the scattered signals or uh, fluorescent signals. And then you use those signals to ac activate the cell disorder to, to sort cells. But this technology does not have spatial resolution. Therefore, you cannot identify and isolate cells based on spatial metrics. So there's a clear trade-off between these two technologies. The microscope with a cell picker, which is high content but low throughput, can find worry, but it will take a long time. On the other hand, the facts, which is low content but high throughput, cannot uh, find worry. Right? So there's a clear trade-off. Uh, in a more uh, pro professional way, uh, uh, this, this trade-off can be sort of translated into this uh, figure merit, where the x-axis is throughput in units of cells per second, the y-axis the cellular information content, basically the amount of information you can extract from each cell. This is the, this region corresponds to the microscope with the cell picture, and this region corresponds to the fluorescence activated cell solder. And if you place the specifications of the commercial instrument, and as you can see here, they fit out these yellow regions. But this is where water is. Right? Uh, this, uh, the red region contains unknown cells, rare cells, small cells, including even the cells. And to find worthy or worthy like cells, you, you need more information to make the invisible visible. And you also need high throughput to eliminate enormous, enormous amount of time and effort. So this is what we need. Basically, we need this worry finding technology. So this intelligent image activated cell sort of we have developed in the, in the past uh, several years addresses the need. 
And let me tell you the history of this uh, naming. So the technology fluorescence acted as the cell solar existed. So we replaced the fluorescence intensity measurement with imaging. So it becomes image activated cell solar. But once we had imaging capability, it actually enabled more sophisticated analysis. So it becomes more intelligent. So the name is intelligent image activated cell solar. So here I show you. This movie shows how this technology works. So this guy put uh, uh, a solution sample here, and the cells go through this yellow tube. And this is a big picture, this is a microfluid chip. And cells go through, flow into this yellow tube. And then we use a hydrodynamic focuser to create a single stream of, of the flowing cells. And then we use a sort of specialized uh, high-speed fluorescence microscope to take a picture of every single cell in flow and we maintain a single uh, stream with the acoustic focus on. And because the cells are flowing in, in the flow direction, we want to cancel out the motion of the flow by using a, a polygon scanner, which is moving in the opposite direction, so that the cells are frozen on the uh, CMOS image sensor to in increase the integration time of fluorescence uh, uh, imaging on the CMOS sensor. And then acquired images are sent to uh, the image processor, where we do uh, a deep learning based image analysis. Uh, then we uh, uh, decide whether we sort or unsort these cells. And then the sort decision signal is sent to the uh, sort, uh, module, where we kick or unkick uh, those cells and then kicked ones going to the, this tube, the collection tube. So eventually we get two tubes that contain sorted cells and unsorted cells. <clears throat> so this is the configuration. Uh, so cells come in to this uh, uh, microfluidic chip and cells flow here in, in this micro channel at one meter per second. And this, this is where we do imaging. So images are acquired and sent to the real-time Im intelligent image processor, where we do uh, image analysis, well, image acquisition, image analysis based on deep learning. And also we do decision making. And then the uh, decision signal is sent to this dual membrane push process, sort of to source cells. And here, um, the cells are flowing at one meter per second. The distance between this imaging part and cell solar part is uh, 32 uh, millimeter. That means we only have 32 milliseconds to do analysis and to make decisions. <clears throat> and this part sort of corresponds to the recognition of the human brain. And this part corresponds to decision-making. This part corresponds to commanding. And this part corresponds to actuation. So in a sense, this whole thing is sort of analogous to this super graduate student uh, who can do, you know, either recognition, decision making, commanding actuation, roughly 1,000 times faster than this uh, normal graduate student. Or it's somewhat equivalent to this Satoshi Omura. So this is a big picture of the, the setup. Uh, this, this is a big picture that we uh, have uh, optical setup here with uh, uh, several monitors to monitor each subsystem. And this is the core of the uh, uh, intelligent image activated cell solar. This is a microfluidic chip. And this is what we do imaging, and this is what we do sorting. So the cells flow from right to left. <clears throat> and let me talk about the details of each uh, key component. So again, we use this imaging technique called a VIFI, virtual freezing fluorescence imaging. Um, so here we use a light C excitation uh, on each cell, uh, which is flowing in this micro channel. And then images are acquired on the CMOS image sensor, but cells are flowing. So to have uh, uh, sort of uh, good images with high sensitivity without motion blur, uh, we need to cancel out the motion. So we use the polygon scanner, which is moving in the opposite direction. So with the polygon scanner on, 
the cells are frozen on the shimo sensor as if they are not moving. <clears throat> and this freezing technique uh, uh, achieves the roughly 1,000 times long exposure time for sensitive roughly uh, fluorescence image acquisition. And therefore, as you can see here, here we have a JAKA cell uh, uh, taken with the exposure time of three seconds, static. And then if you throw the cells, and if you have a, uh, a long, uh, well, a short exposure time, you, you can get a picture, but it's quite dim. If you decrease, increase the integration time, you see huge motion blur, so you cannot see it. But now with a uh, uh, polygon scanner on by DFI, virtual freezing uh, process imaging, we can have you know, clear image without motion blur. And this is a sort of the intelligent image processor. This can images come in and then sent to this uh, brain part, which is composed of a lot of CPUs, DRAMs, and GPUs, where we do uh, real-time image processing and real-time deep learning-based analysis. And then decision, decision signals are generated and sent to the uh, cell driver. And this is a microhood chip. Uh, so cells flow into this uh, uh, three-layer microfluidic chip. It's a, uh, made of glass, silicon glass. And then when the target cell comes, uh, we do sorting uh, based on this uh, 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 <clears throat> push-proof cell sorter, which is composed of two uh, piezoelectric actuator with glass membrane. So when the target cell comes, we push this membrane and we pull this membrane so that there's a secondary flow that kicks the target cells. And we can do this in the other direction. So these trajectory images show uh, uh, that we can do sorting of you know, uh, cells uh, moving at high speed of one meter per second. And then this kind of shows the basic performance with frozen beats. This basically shows the events, rank over the, over the events. So each event is actually a single cell, um, uh, a debris or clusters of cells. And y-axis in, indicates how much time it takes to analyze and sort each event or each cell. And with the classical image analysis, uh, all the events took less than 32 milliseconds, which is good. And then we achieved about 1,000 uh, cells per second. With a convolution neural network that performs deep, deep learning, <clears throat> well, with, even with deep learning, we can still uh, identify and sort 90, nearly 99% of the cells uh, successfully with a throughput of roughly 1,000 cells per second. So this video shows how this uh, technology works in practice. So in the morning, we discuss uh, what kind of experiments to perform. And then uh, this guy put the sample into this uh, machine and, and push the start button. And then we wait for, I don't know, 20 minutes, one hour, depending on the experiment. And then we monitor each system um, to make sure that the, everything is working correctly. And then finally, when the experiment is done, we collect two chips that contain sorted and unsorted cells. And then uh, finally, we analyze sorted cells to make sure that the sorted cells are the, the right species of cells we, we wanted. And at the end, we discuss uh, how to deal with the sorted cells. Uh, some people want to use uh, the sorted cells for uh, direct devolution, or some people want to further analyze the cells under uh, electron microscope or, or sequencing. So we achieved uh, this throughput and also uh, set information contest. We conquered this unknown area for the first time in 2018. And we recently uh, made a further improvement in the specifications. Yeah, so we want to go that way, or maybe that way. Maybe. On, on the no, top right, basically, to, to find even more rare uh, uh, worry or worry like cells. So here are the applications. Uh, so of course, this technology is not just limited to urina cells, but also many 
other cells, the budding E cell, T cells, cancer cells, and so on and so forth. Because this conference is focused on eugrenoids, so let me sort of focus on this eugrenoid glacier cells. So these images are captured uh, by this intelligent image uh, uh, activated cell solar. So these cells, let me remind you that these cells are flowing at one minute per second, which is quite fast. So one of the application is, so you gonna grab these cells under nitrogen sufficient or nitrogen deficient cells. So here the throughput is roughly uh, 1,000 cells per second. So we only took roughly 12 seconds to acquire 12,000 images of urine aggressive cells under uh, nitrogen su sufficient or nitrogen deficient conditions. As you can see, the, the differences are clear. So green, green dots corresponds to lipid droplets and the red one uh, corresponds to chlorophyll. And with these images, we can do a lot of data-driven analysis. For example, here, we can uh, uh, plot this kind of histogram uh, uh, by and the number of intercellular lipid droplets per cell. And this is not eugrenoid, but I, I guess, uh, you know, you are some microbiologist, so you, you may be uh, finding this in, uh, interesting. So we also do uh, food science based on budding yeast cells. So here we, you can see wine yeast, BI yeast, and sake yeast. And they look quite similar. But actually, they are morphologically different. And, and previous studies showed that there's a strong correlation between the morphology of budding in cells and the taste of wine, beer, sake, and so on and so forth. So we, we you know, target specific morphological features and isolate uh, those cells to generate a kind of new taste of wine or beer and sake. And recently we have done it and we isolated four yeast, budding yeast cells with very uh, di distinct, four, four distinct morphological features. And we uh, developed beer, four, four, four types of beer based on that and had a, like a beer tasting event. Another application is cancer biology. So, you know, 90% of cancer deaths are caused by the CTCs. You know, circulating tumor cells that migrating in the bloodstream. And conventional CTC detectors are not very efficient because they rely on single parameters. But we do imaging, so we can identify um, nucleus, surface antigen, and cytoplasm simultaneously. And we also identify um, uh, clusters of cancer cells, you know, CTC, CTC clusters or CTC. Um, uh, white blood cells or uh, uh, red blood cell clusters. We also do a uh, cancer immunotherapy. So, you know, CAR T cell therapy is kind of hot topic nowadays. And we, we do uh, uh, identification of the immunological synapse, which indicates the uh, immune response of T cells. And we only identify the good ones with very high immune response and we, we sort them and then we inject it back into the human body so that the, this CAR T cell therapy is much more efficient. And recently we have made this technology level free by using Raman image activated cell solving. So Raman is based on Raman scuttling. Uh, some people do not want to use fluorescence detection because fluorescence requires you know, fluorescent labeling with fluorescent uh, probes. Um, so many microbiologists do not have the right uh, fluorescent probes for studying um, some new species. And also like, you know, stem cell researchers do not want uh, fluorescent labeling. So we, we are using this uh, coherent Raman uh, spectroscopy to actually probe the molecular vibration directly within the cell. And that uh, in, uh, sort of gives the molecular images without the need for person probe. So I'm not gonna go to the, the details, but we developed that kind of new type of laser for coherent uh, Raman spectroscopy. And we uh, 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 inject that laser into this uh, image active cell solids, uh, system to acquire uh, Raman images. 
and uh, we do the basic performance. So these are uh, uh, four different, uh, uh, three different uh, polymer beads with different uh, molecular signatures, and in the PS, PMMA, and PE, and beads. So we can see, we can uh, detect the uh, these uh, different species of polymer beads with RAMA images. And we apply to uh, uh, Uganda cells. So in nitrogen sufficient day zero, nitrogen deficient day 10, day 20, 58. And you can see uh, uh, these Uganda cells. These are flowing, so flowing at two, uh, two centimeter per second. And again, these are level free images, but we can still obtain uh, molecular images of Uganda. And because we have the power to acquire lots of images, we can apply deep learning to do further analysis. And then uh, from the images, we can uh, estimate the, uh, the condition of, uh, uh, of, of cultivation with very, very high accuracy, more than 99%. So the future, so we have, after the publication of these papers, a number of people have sent me emails saying that they want to use the technology. So we actually made this uh, technology uh, available to the publics. We, so we formed a sort of a network of uh, collaborators. Currently we are doing uh, roughly more than, more than 20 uh, collaborative projects. And then we couldn't handle all the projects. So we started this uh, company called Cybo to commercialize this uh, image activity so. And in the future, we want to do unsupervised learning. So machine learning is actually uh, split into three uh, directions. And this is what we did uh, and I talked about today. And this is based on supervised learning. And this is unsupervised learning. This basically, we told uh, how the world looks like in this work, but eventually, we do not need to tell the AI how what it looks like. So then we can find like a unique uh, Ugrina grassy cells without telling how they look like. <clears throat> That's what we want to do in the future. And this is a kind of listed uh, list of uh, publication related to this work. Again, in the uh, screen capture. Okay. So I'd like to acknowledge my group members and funding agencies. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Kazuki, for the, that excellent talk. Very interesting <laughs> understanding like the actual process of how that is done. So thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, next, so we'll uh, save any questions till the, the panel discussion. So uh, feel free to stop sharing your screen. And next we will have uh, Dr. Muhammad Aldomi whose paper actually received the best paper award yesterday. So Mohammed will be giving a talk on the discovery of novel uh, cyclic uh, lipopeptides from euglena through nutritional manipulation. So Mohammed, please feel free to go ahead. Hello, Hello. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, can you see the screen? We can see it, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for, for the invitation. And uh, yeah, as you can see the title, I'm going to talk about the discovery of novel LIBO peptides from Euglena. Uh, this was part of my PhD and the, the supervision of uh, Professor Gannison and uh, co-supervision of Rob Feld and Barry Wilkinson. Um, so in my uh, PhD, I was <clears throat> trying to do genomic and transcriptomic guided discovery trying to find like novel natural products um, and using them as, as a drugs. So you can see the workflow of my project, starting with genomic uh, and transcriptomic analysis, trying to find putative like genes for novel natural products. And then if we see like potential uh, 
novel genes or uh, genes for novel natural products, we start doing uh, manipulation of culture or using some uh, activators trying to activate the, the genes. Um, and then the next step is um, harvesting the culture, extracting it, and comparing the metabolic profiles using the HPLC and uh, mass spectrometry. And if we can see the uh, novel natural products or the possibly novel natural products produced, then we start doing large scale uh, cultivation and extraction to purify the compounds and um, do the structural sedation. And then we um, start uh, investigating their uh, bioactivity using different bioassays. And the final <clears throat> step is doing molecular networking um, trying to find any like uh, related or similar like compounds in um, in uh, the same like uh, within the same genus in different uh, species. So uh, I started like studying different species of microalgae, and some of them they were like the complete genomes published, and for some others we only had the transcriptomes. But there was actually one paper published by. Um, um, Dr. Ellis and his supervisor, Rob Feld, uh, about the Euglena gracilis. And I found it interesting when I saw like there are like more than uh, 30 possible like uh, non-ribosomal peptides and polyketides that could be produced by uh, the Euglena gracilis. So I started working on this, trying to use like different types of uh, uh, cultivation uh, conditions, trying to induce the production of these compounds and get them um, isolated or actually initially produced. Uh, so I used like eutrophic, uh, eutrophic conditions with light and complex medium, the common medium EGGM. Uh, nothing was produced there. I couldn't detect like any polyketides or peptides. The main compounds were there were like xanthophyll and chlorophyll like pigments. And the same with heterotrophic conditions in the dark uh, using the complex medium and glucose. Uh, it was the same thing, just some pigments, uh, no peptides or polyketides there. And then I started playing in the um, fermentation conditions like time, pH, and also I was adding some epigenetic modulators, trying to play like in the epigenetic like um, things trying to induce the productions based on what was mentioned in previous papers that the epigenetic um, like histone acetylation, deacetylation and these things might play some, some I think like in the metabolism, but still nothing was produced there. Uh, so next I was reading again and again about the euglena gracilis and the best conditions like uh, to grow them. And I came across a paper published by Oda and his uh, colleagues that they reported that individual amino acids can promote or inhibit growth of euglena gracilis. So I was thinking, oh, okay, if this is affecting the growth, it should be affecting also the metabolism and especially the secondary metabolism. So I started removing the tryptone yeast extract and replacing them with uh, individual amino acids and they created a medium and they named it minimal <clears throat> medium. And then I started adding individual amino acids. And it was interesting because you can see here the complex medium and the change when I was adding like individual, just individual like amino acids, like the complex medium, it contains different types of amino acids while the, the other like minimal uh, media, they contain only one like individual amino acids. And I started seeing like these compounds. So I thought, okay, there is one peak there. It's easily like isolated. But actually when I started like extending the analysis uh, time, I found out that there were actually several compounds there and uh, I was trying then to identify them using the high resolution MS. So using the high resolution MS, we could uh, predict the formula uh, for uh, these uh, compounds that we named uh, euglenotides A to E. Uh, and I started searching the databases if there are any like similar compounds. I mean, like something with a similar like molecular formula or uh, something with a similar like accurate mass, but there was nothing like corresponding to, to these uh, compounds or these masses. Um, I checked the UV visible profile and I found this like profile 
after searching like the databases, it's like indicative of uh, conjugated trying. The IR absorptions was suggesting the presence of amides. So I was doing large scale fermentation, trying to get enough for the NMR because this was the most like exciting like uh, point in time when I got to this point, finding like something uh, novel uh, from this like very well known uh, Euclidean species. So I started doing like large scale fermentation, 18 liter, and I got uh, like 187 milligrams of the euglenotide mixtures. And then after several like steps of the HPLC uh, purification, I got a few milligrams of uh, H euglenotide. So <clears throat> I started with the euglenotide B, did the NMR and the NMR proton and carbon NMR indicated like seven carbonyl groups and nine amide uh, protons. There were some like overlapping methylene uh, signals uh, indicating the presence of aliphatic uh, chain. And um, then I did the 2D NMR, cozy HMBC, HCQC and tried to put the structure together. And finally, I got this like possible uh, structure for, for uh, the isolated purified uh, compounds. And this was for the euglenotide B. So I started searching the, the databases for any like similar compounds. And interestingly, I found similar compound called nemamide uh, that was isolated like a few years ago from uh, C. elegans. So after that, I was trying to figure out the stereochemistry for um, these uh, compounds. And uh, I started with uh, um, hydrolysis, doing the Murphy analysis, because this is the easiest and the best way to identify the stereochemistry of the amino acids. And through the Murphy analysis, I could uh, find the L-asparagine and the D-asparagine in euglenotide B, while in euglenotide A, I could find the uh, D-asparagine. So again, with the Murphy's analysis, I could also identify the stereochemistry for the beta amino isobutyric acid and the, um, also the dihydroxy uh, norphalene. So I was left with this side, like in this C20 like amino acid, which is the most complicated one. The Murphy's analysis was not of help for this because there are no uh, su suitable like standards for comparison. And the, the other thing is the this C20 amino acid was easily destroyed by uh, the hydrolysis. Um, as I can see from the MS when I was uh, running the, the, the samples after uh, the MS, after the, the hydrolysis. So after several experiments, NMR experiments, and also obtaining the CD spectrum, I compared all of this to the ROISE from the nemamide and also the CD spectrum from the nemamide, uh, coupling constants, all of these things with the help of some NMR experiment, uh, experts, I could find the final uh, like configuration, the full complete like stereochemistry for uh, the five compounds. And then after that, I was investigating the bioactivity for these compounds against uh, bacteria, fungi, and human uh, cancer cell lines. The compounds appear to be inactive against gram-positive and negative bacteria, uh, but they were highly active against fungi and uh, human cancer uh, cell lines. And by the way, the nemamides might have actually the same uh, or similar activity against the eukaryotic cells, but because the amount they obtained when they isolated the nemamides from C. elegans, they were very, very small amounts. So it was not possible to do any like uh, bioassays. But if we obtained them like in enough amount, maybe they would have some um, similarity in terms of, of activity. So also we tested the activity against the producers because there was some, in, in the previous study about the C. elegans, they mentioned the role like of nemamide for the recovery after starvation of the C. elegans, but we found actually the opposite. They were toxic to the uh, C. elegans and they inhibited the recovery after uh, starvation. 
Uh, and the same for the euglena gracilis, when we added the euglena type B uh, to the culture medium, we found uh, that it was actually inhibiting the, the growth of euglena uh, gracilis. So they might be actually playing important um, function in, in low amounts, but what, once they become like in, in higher concentrations or we add them in higher concentrations, then they start um, being uh, toxic, uh, or they might be actually just stored in some compartments in, inside the organism. So maybe um, they are not, um, I mean, th there is no like solar exposure uh, to them, so they are not causing any toxicity. But once we add them like as external compounds, then they start uh, being toxic. And then the final uh, step that we did was that we got different like species of euglena, euglena gracilis, euglena sanguinea, euglena mutabilis, and we cultivate them in uh, the same minimal media, like supplemented with amino acids. Um, and when we did then, the, we extracted the, the culture and we did MS and MS, MS, and using the MS, <clears throat> MS fragments, we could like create uh, a network that's representing the, the compounds um, uh, similar like or, or to euglena or euglena like euglena tied like compounds uh, produced by these uh, three uh, species so there were actually more than uh, 40 compounds produced by uh, these three uh, species and you can see the euglena sanguinea is producing um, high amounts or actually many of these uh, types like of compounds. Uh, the euglena gracilis was producing um, still like more compounds of, of these types than the euglena metabolis. Euglena metabolis, you can see a few compounds produced. But interestingly, you can see that even though they have some similarity, it's still like each species is, is producing different compounds. There is some like overlapping in some compounds, but still they are producing like uh, different uh, compounds. So each node of this represents the precursor mass of a single metabolite. The color of the nodes, they indicates the relative abundance of each metabolite between the strains. Uh, and then the masses for the um, euglenotides that we isolated, you can see them, these five Five compounds. The rest are still novel, still to be uh, identified by some um, researchers. Uh, so to summarize, the euglenotides are cyclic uh, peptides incorporating non-proteinogenic like novel amino acids, um, and the euglenotides potently inhibit the growth of uh, fungi and human cancer cells, as well as the producers, um, euglena and uh, C. elegans. Uh, the euglenotides, they share structural similarity with the uh, nemamides from the C. elegans, which is uh, interesting. So finally, I would like to acknowledge um, all uh, the uh, participating people in, in this project, especially my supervisors, and all the collaborators uh, from uh, the UK, Spain, uh, France, uh, and Germany. And thanks uh, to all of you for attending and listening. And this is the barcode for uh, my published paper of this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your discovery of these euglenotides. It's very exciting work. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to our uh, next speaker and the one that will be ending our talks for this particular section. So we have uh, Def Dr. Jeff Horst from Kemen, who will be telling us about some recent efficacy studies of beta-glucan from euglena and the immune health and performance of dairy calves and cows. So Mohammed, if you will go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Great. We'll let uh, Dr. Jeff Horst take over. Please go ahead. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Good. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you to the organizing committee. 
uh, for a great conference so far. Um, so yeah, as Aaron introduced, um, I'll be giving a brief update on some of the recent studies that have been done with our euglena beta glucan immune product called Alita. So last year in the conference, I gave a little bit more of a, a detailed primer on the immune system and how that relates to using the beta glucan from euglena. Uh, but I'll just give a very brief kind of overview again, just to refresh people's memory or if you weren't here last year. Uh, I think we're all familiar that Euglena and specifically Euglena gracilis produces paramyelin. Uh, and these paramyelin granules are nearly pure beta 1 3 glucan. Uh, so, this very long strand polymer of glucose that's arranged in a very specific pattern, um, which is the beta 1 3 linkages. And so, this particular pattern is really important because it's the same uh, molecular pattern that's found in the cell walls of pathogenic organisms like yeast and bacteria. And so we utilize that, I guess, evolutionary history to our advantage to make a commercial product uh, where we can give uh, that beta-glucan orally to animals in order to induce certain immune responses to help the immune system of animals. Um, and so on the bottom right-hand picture just shows kind of an illustration of how this happens in real life. We have some macrophage cells uh, from mice, and they're encountering a paramyelin granule. And after a short while, it's starting to, uh, it recognizes it with those receptors, and then it phagocytoses that, um, that paramyelin granule into the cell. Um, and this kind of starts the whole cascade of various immune responses um, within the animal. And so the real, I guess, I guess biological goal of using a product like Alita is to actually elicit a kind of a balanced immune response. And so we call that priming. Um, so what's unique about beta-1,3 glucan as a pure molecule is that it induces both pro-inflammatory responses in the immune system. So this is what actually helps um, with vaccination responses. So think of like an adjuvant where we want to help elevate the immune response to let's say a vaccine antigen. Um, but at the same time, it also produces anti-inflammatory cytokines. And so this helps to calm down the immune system. And so we can use this as an immune modulator so that animals that are over inflamed, either due to diseases or environmental stresses like heat, we can actually bring down the inflammation by giving beta-glucan. And if you have a newborn animal that has a very low immune system to start off with, we can actually help to accelerate and prime that animal's immune system. Um, and that gives the animal a very good start to life uh, when they start to encounter natural pathogens in their environment. And so commercially, uh, we use Alita. It's been in the market now for eight or nine years at this point. Um, and so the types of animals that we want to be giving Alita to include animals that receive a lot of vaccinations. So pretty much every commercial animal nowadays, whether it's chickens, pigs, fish even, uh, they receive tons of different vaccines throughout their life. Um, and so we've been finding that including Alita improves the vaccination efficiency. Um, we also give Alita during stressful time periods. So example would be like sows uh, right before and after they're giving birth. It's a very stressful time period in their life. Um, it also reduces mortality and remidity uh, during pathogen outbreaks. Um, and also, you've probably heard a lot about using antibiotics in animal production. And so, thankfully, most of the world is starting to ban the use of antibiotics in the feed. Um, but that opens up those animals to a whole host of biological um, stresses that they uh, usually were just kind of um, covered up by those antibiotics. But now they're being exposed to these pathogens again for the first time. And so, Alita really helps those animals defend against those pathogens. Uh, using their own natural immune system. And so this all then translates into, uh, at the end, a, a good return on investment for the farmers that are utilizing a product. So uh, a penny invested here uh, translates into many pennies earned um, from improvements in the, the, I guess, the growth rates, as well as the feed efficiency of these animals um, in our production systems. Um, and so we've done well over 50 studies demonstrating the efficacy and safety um, but up until now, most of our work has been done on poultry and swine and also with aquaculture species 
and very little actually on ruminants. And so that includes cows, uh, just because doing ruminant studies are really expensive. Um, and, um, but they are, they are important. So over 10% of the protein consumed uh, by humans worldwide comes from dairy. And so it is an important part of our food system. And so uh, what I'm gonna show you is uh, four different studies that have been done in the past year, um, looking at uh, cows and also with calves done with some of our partners. And so this first study uh, from some of our partners in China um, looked at dosing in Alida to uh, mother cows, both for the first 21 days leading up to birth and then the next 21 days. And so during that very stressful time period. Um, and so we had three different treatment groups. We had a control group with no beta-glucan. Then we had a low and a high dose at five and 10 grams of Alita dose per day uh, to these uh, mothers. And what we saw from this is that um, with the groups that had beta-glucan in them, uh, we saw an increase in milk production. So that's one of the ultimate commercial goals, of course. Um, and in that milk, we actually saw reduced um, bacterial counts. So that's called the somatic cell count. Um, and so that means that it had an improved milk quality. Um, a lot of times the quality of the milk is determined by how much of this background bacteria is in the milk. Uh, we also saw increase in um, immunoglobulins in the colostrum. So that's that first milk-like material that comes from the mother and that's given to the newborns. And so that helps to jumpstart the immune system of those calves. And so critically here, we saw that there was an increased level in the IgG levels um, in that colostrum being passed on to their calves. Um, and we also saw increases in the IgG levels even in the mother's serum. And so you can see um, at the time of um, birth, which is the middle figure, the D1 figures, um, you can see that there's a depression in IgG levels. So that's the depression in the immune system of those mothers right after calving, uh, but with the beta-glucan groups, that uh, depression is attenuated. Um, and then we also saw an increase in antioxidant capacity um, in the mother's serum. And so all indications suggesting that the supplementation with the beta-glucan helped to mitigate some of those negative um, stressful um, impacts on the mother's health during uh, the calving period. Um, in the next paper, uh, which utilized the same, um, the same study cows, uh, we were getting into a little bit more of the specifics on some of the, uh, the serum metabolites. And so uh, here, what we saw is that uh, the, the body condition of the mothers was improved. And so what we're looking at is the fat levels in the mother's serum. And so during that calving period, um, some of the mothers have to dip into those critical fat reserves in order to kind of make it through and, and maintain um, body health. And so that would be indicated by a drop usually in the triglyceride levels and cholesterol levels in the serum. And you can see that in the control group on the left-hand panel, um, but with the groups that were supplemented with Alita, we can see that those um, cows were able to maintain a higher level of triglycerides um, in their serum. So they didn't have to dip into those fat reserves as much as the control group. Um, and then similarly, we can look at things like um, the liver health enzymes um, and uh, liver stress enzymes like ALT. And so following the birthing period um, in the control animals, you can see there's a drastic increase um, in the ALT level. So that's indicative of um, hepatic stress, whereas with the Alita treated animals, um, that key liver stress enzyme is kind of maintained at normal levels. Um, so again, uh, lots of different ways to assess the health of the mothers here, but um, supplementing with the Alita appears to have attenuated a lot of those negative effects, which is consistent with our mode of action that shows that you can have a, um, a strong anti-inflammatory benefit uh, with using the beta-1,3 glucan. Uh, so the next two studies were done in Brazil. And so this first study was looking at giving Alita to day-old calves. And so right after they're born, um, the calves are actually given a milk replacer, which kind of simulates the milk that comes from the mothers. And in that milk replacer, uh, we placed two grams of the algae beta glucan in there. And what we saw over the 56 day period of the study was that the calves that were supplemented with the beta glucan saw 10% higher weight gain. That is quite extraordinary. <laughs> um, 
And so you can imagine that the calves that are exiting the nursery, 10% um, heavier, those animals are gonna fare much better as they transition into adults. Um, we also saw improvements in the feed efficiencies, especially at week three and five. And what's also critically important is that there was a substantial decrease in diarrhea incidents. And so you might not know, but uh, diarrhea is quite common with newborn calves. And so in the control group, over half of the days um, in that nursery, the calves were experiencing diarrhea conditions. Whereas in less than 8% of the days uh, in the Alito animals, they're experiencing diarrhea. So um, that helps to explain this weight gain and feed efficiency discrepancy is that you can see in some of those periods with the control animals, sometimes they are barely gaining any weight. And if they have serious bouts of diarrhea, they're basically consuming a lot of feed, but putting on very little weight during this important growth period. Um, so the same researchers also did a microbiome study um, in conjunction uh, with the growth study. And what it revealed is that there is, of course, substantial changes in the microbiome with age. And so the animals are um, taking on some of the microbiome from their mothers, but they're also starting to take on some of the microbiome just from their environment. And there was um, a, I would call it a significant, but it's still to, to be determined whether or not it's um, biologically relevant, uh, but there was significant differences in at least two genus level um, bacteria communities. And so um, in this case, there was two genuses that were substantially increased in the Alita group. Um, and these two genus levels, they are correlated in this particular study uh, with improvements in the fecal scores, which would be consistent with the diarrhea that we are seeing, um, as well as with feed intake and also with um, protein levels in the serum. So you typically want to have low levels of protein in your serum. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll, we'll investigate more of the microbiome in future studies, but this is at least indicative of being consistent with the diarrhea scores and the weight gains that we are seeing um, in the calf growth study. So that's all for this uh, year and next year we'll have some new data. Um, so I would encourage everyone to come to my colleague's um, presentation later on um, this afternoon where she'll be talking about Betavia, which is our human health product. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jeff. All right, thank you to all of our speakers uh, for your wonderful talks. So we're going to start into our question period now. So if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat. Or if you would like to ask it directly, please feel free to raise your hand uh, so that we can uh, have our discussion section uh, flow well. So I guess I will start this off. Um, so I have a question for uh, Kazuki. So specifically talking about uh, the different cell sorting, et cetera, uh, technology that you were talking about. Um, I was wondering if, uh, so the different cell shapes and stages of growth, do this, does this influence uh, the cell composition readings? Um, for example, if they are insisted or things along those lines, how does that exactly um, influence the readings for your composition of the cells. Kazuki, are you still there? I think Kazuki had to leave, Aaron. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so then we will switch over to, we won't do questions for Kazuki. All right, uh, so for Mohammed uh, in the chat, do you have any indication about the biochemistry underlying the synthesis of these euglenotides? Um, no, actually, we didn't go into the biochemistry part because, you know, I'm, I'm mostly doing like a discovery just for novel like natural products, trying to identify the structures and the bioactivity. I'm not going into like the molecular biology or the, the biochemistry part. Uh, so, and, you know, again, because, you know, we don't have that complete, like, genome for this. So we were, like, trying at least to predict some, you know, biosynthetic, like, gene clusters and how, how this is, like, uh, made. Uh, but, again, because of the lack of the complete genome, we couldn't, like, um, you know, do any any analysis of this type. Uh, the, the complete, like, you know, biosynthetic pathway for the nemamide 
uh, is is published. So I think you can get some idea from from that, like how 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 this is like biosynthesized. But in terms of Euglena, we have no idea. Okay. So following up on that, so what do you think the role is of these euglenotides in euglena? As they seem to inhibit growth, but they're- I, I was um, just, just like as a prediction, maybe it might be keeping like the, um, the euglena uh, species just like dormant, just like not consuming like the food when it has like you know it doesn't have like enough maybe uh, of the food so maybe we are when we are adding just one single amino acid it's feeling that it has only this one source like of the nitrogen so it's trying to uh, maybe produce this compound and you know try to just decrease the growth because we can easily see like the, the difference in terms of the growth between the minimal medium when we are adding just one single amino acid and the complex medium when you, you have the tryptone and this yeast extract. You can see how dense it is when you are adding tryptone and yeast extract compared to, to just single amino acid. So the growth is slower and also the density, even after, you know, when it's like, you know, getting to the stationary phase, it's still the density, it's much, much higher in, in the complex medium. So maybe it's trying, you know, just to stop it from growing and consuming more uh, nutrients. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, question from Vladimir to Mohammed. So do you know how toxic or inhibitory the compounds are for normal human cells? And uh, no, we didn't have any normal like human cells. All the ones that we had in the lab were cancerous like cell lines. So we just tried them on the cancerous uh, cell lines. Okay. And within kind of the cultural conditions that you grew it in, um, would you expect, what conditions would you expect in nature that could allow these euglenotides to be produced? Are there any specific predators or something that might elicit the production of these compounds, do you think? Um, not sure. I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's just the types of the nutrients that they are present there. I mean, if if it's producing these compounds just, you know, to, to just slow the growth uh, and, you know, try to uh, keep them like dormant for, for some time. I'm expecting if there is lack of some like nutrients, then these are the, the these are produced. But I'm not sure if there are any compounds when they are added there, then they are increasing the production. Uh, we didn't get any anything like this, even though we added some elicitors, some chemical elicitors, and we were expecting maybe we'll get some compounds produced, but we, we didn't have anything like this. So I guess for um, application of euglena in large scale cultivation and use in human food production, things along those lines, what would you say we need to be mindful of when we're growing euglena at these large scales based on your analysis with the media components and what we're adding and, and uh, changes in fermentation conditions? Well, if, if these compounds, you know, because we, we can see these compounds are very toxic, at least to the cancer cells. So if we get, like if we are growing them in a medium that is helping the production of these compounds, then we are making something toxic. And, you know, they are using like the euglena in food and in different like aspects as a healthy, you know, food or as, as a medicinal maybe product um, to help like the immune stimulation or something like this. So if we are, if you, we are growing them in a medium that is actually helping the production of these toxic compounds, Maybe we are we are you know giving some toxic uh, food to people, um, so using the minimal medium, the ones that I used will definitely help the production of these uh, compounds. Still, they are produced in very small amounts, so we are not sure if you are consuming like you know these amounts just in regular like you know uh, amounts. I'm not sure if you will get 
to the toxic like levels, but still maybe there are some other conditions when you get very like, you know, high amounts of these compounds. So we need to be, you know, careful about these uh, um, like types of conditions. But in terms of the conditions that we know, the, the, usually it's the EGGM that is used to grow the euglena. So in that we couldn't see um, anything like any any of these toxic compounds. Okay, so under the standard conditions where what we typically grow in, you didn't notice those. Yeah. Okay, so um, what other compounds? So you looked at um, non-ribosomal peptide synthesis and polyketide synthesis, like biosynthetic um, components of that. So what other compounds do you think could be found in euglena when you compare that to other organisms that use uh, these ways of uh, modes of metabolism? Are you looking at other, other, other compounds as well or? Uh, no, actually the focus was mostly on the polyketides and uh, non-ribosomal peptides because from you know the genomic and transcriptomic analysis, we can easily find these ones. The others are terpenoids. Uh, so um, sometimes like for, for the, I worked also on aspergillus and we found some like interesting like terpenoids there that seem to be novel, but for the euglena, I also relied on the publication, you know, by uh, Prof. Um, Robfeld. Uh, so we just went straight trying to find polyketides and, uh, uh, and non-ribosomal peptides, but maybe some, some terpenoids are maybe present there, but we, we didn't, we didn't discover them because it, under the standard, like, you know, conditions, you can only see there the, the chlorophyll and xanthophylls. You cannot see anything else. So maybe changing like these, you know, types like of uh, media, one day you will get something else different, like from these uh, nanorobosomal like polyketide compounds. Right. And, and what's the next step for your analysis with these euglenotides? Are you going further with that or? Well, to be honest, I, I moved to Saudi Arabia. Uh, so here we, we missed uh, the facilities to grow these things. Here in Saudi Arabia, they are focusing more on plants, collection of plants and trying to discover from plants. While like when I was in the UK, the discovery was from microorganisms. So at the moment, we don't have the facilities here even to grow, uh, you know, just like any like types of, of microorganisms. So I stopped like at this point um in the future if i you know manage to get uh, like um um a leaf like from from my uh, job just to to do some research in the uk maybe i'll go back again to the same lab and try to um, search uh, i mean try to detect like these compounds in the euglena sanguinea and the euglena metabolis i think for the for the euglena gracilis what I have got is is enough for the euglena gracilis. I'm I'm interested like in those compounds. You can see like the euglena uh, sanguinea. It's producing so many compounds, and none of them is like similar to the one in the euglena uh, gracilis. And I, I would like to compare: are they like more toxic, less toxic? Are they having like different types of bioactivity? Because you know the previous ones were not active against bacteria. So right. I would like also to try the others and see if they have any antibacterial activity, do they have any activity against the prokaryote, like different from, from the ones that we already discovered? Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Jiang uh, to Jeff. Is there any association between paramyelin sizes and the immune effects on animal health? Um, we haven't studied that particular question. However, the way that we're harvesting um, the euglena from the fermenters, we're basically capturing every single size class of the paramyelin. So um, as you grow these euglena cells, um, you do have a spectrum of different paramyelin sizes. Um, so I guess we're giving them everything. <laughs> so they're going to be getting some small, some big. Uh, but one could imagine that since this is mostly um, a superficial type of interaction where the immune receptors are going to be interacting with the beta-glucan um, paramyelin granule. The more surface area you have of the beta-glucan, so like smaller particles are going to have more surface ligand available to interact with the immune cells. But we haven't been specifically trying to manipulate 
um, paramyelin sizes, and we haven't seen any, uh, we haven't done any studies to investigate paramyelin size. Okay. Um, well, following up on that, so you mentioned that you have it when you're using beta glucan, it can have both a priming and so it can have an anti inflammatory effect as well as a pro inflammatory effect. So, when does this happen? You mentioned it some in the calves and versus um, cows, but how, how exactly does that happen? So, so since the beta glucan is triggering some of those immune receptors, it's really after the immune cells are detecting the beta-glucan that they start to communicate with the rest of the immune cells through the cytokines. And so um, what we see is that you elevate actually both pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory ones. And so it really is a balancing act that if you have some commands to let's say the army saying, okay, get ready, that's the pro-inflammatory side. But if you're also starting to increase the commands that say, all right, we don't need to overreact here. That's what's going to be helping with the overinflammation. And so it's really a balance of how many of those signals are saying ramp up and how many of them say ramp down. Um, but in the case of where, as an example, if we give pigs an E. coli infection, um, it's going to start to cause inflammation in the animal. So even though that's starting to ramp up, um, the animal is then starting to get the signal saying, don't worry too much about that, we need to ramp down the inflammation. So it's really uh, the fact that it's, it's sending out those signals saying, okay, don't worry too much about it, is what's really keeping it from overreacting. Um, and so that's what's kind of unique about beta-1,3 specifically, um, whereas there's a lot of other molecules. And so Muhammad kind of spoke about, you know, euglena produces thousands of different molecules, and some of them might be all inflammatory, or some of them might be all anti-inflammatory. But what's unique about beta-1,3 glucan is that it appears to elevate both at the same time. And that's a nice balanced tool that you can be using. Okay. So how exactly does, um, when the analysis was done on the microbiome, how does beta-glucan influence the microbiome? Like what is the mechanism by which it, it, it shifts uh, the predominance of certain species? Yeah, that's a really great question. So previously we've done tons of microbiome work with. Um, with mice and also in vitro and ex vivo studies. And it is true that it's a prebiotic by itself. So it's a polysaccharide. And so we have found that if you put it in with probiotic species like lactobacillus, lactobacillus can use it directly just like other prebiotics. Um, we don't think it has a direct negative killing effect on any of the pathogenic organisms. Um, so our best feeling about this is that when you're in an animal, uh, a lot of this microbiome change is probably mediated by the host. And so, um, you know, the animal itself is also exudating a bunch of molecules that are affecting the microbiome and vice versa. And so when we see these more drastic changes in the populations, it's probably due to the fact that the health of the animal is also uh, modulating that microbiome. And so if you have a leaky gut syndrome, um, there's two-way passage of molecules in and out of that animal. And so um, that's how we think it's happening. And in this particular study with the cows, we're not exactly sure, but that's um, our working hypothesis is that um, it's kind of a, a, a relationship with the host uh, that's also shaping the microbiome. Um, okay. But in general, you want to increase those probiotic species like lactobacillus and the other species that are really good at breaking down complex carbohydrates into um, those acidic uh, precursors like acetates uh, that are helpful for gut health. Thanks. And so you talked mostly about um, Alta, so your animal beta glucan, but uh, in your abstract, you talked a little bit about beta via for human health. So is there, what are the differences between these products and how, how exactly does that, that, that work? Sure, sure. And so my colleagues, um, they'll talk a little bit more about beta via during the showcase. Um, but that one's been focused on humans right from the get go. And so we have two different versions. We have one that's um, dried euglena as well. So it'll include the other components of euglena, um, proteins, fats, pigments, etc. And then we also have a version that's just pure beta 1,3 glucan. So depending upon the formulations that 
um, let's say functional food manufacturers want. Um, they can use the pure, relatively tasteless pure beta glucan, or they can use the whole cell algae as well. And so uh, with our studies on beta via, um, you know, we're, we're focusing in on both the beta glucan content as well as some of those other non-beta glucan fractions, which um, there's decades of research that we could do on that as well. Um, but the beta glucan is the more uh, straightforward mode of action since um, we know the molecule and you can do tons of in vitro and in vivo assays to really elucidate that mode of action. Whereas uh, we could be studying it for a very long time on what all the other metabolites are doing um, to the immune health. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yep. All right, uh, if there's no other questions, I don't see anything else popping up in the chat. Um, I would just like to thank all of our speakers. So Kazuki, Mohammed, and Jeff, thank you very much for uh, presenting in this session. And I'll give it back to Scott to introduce John. <laughs> thank you so much, Aaron, and to all the speakers. Again, that was a fantastic session. A bit of a change up from previous days and quite interesting. It's, it's amazing to see all the different things Euglena uh, is being used for. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to um, John Knight. John uh, is a seasoned veteran in the Trent Research Office in the Peterborough community. Um, also uh, uh, a mentor of mine, and um, I'll hand it over to John to talk a little bit about um, the EIN um, uh, network. Over to you, John. Thanks, Scott, and we'll see if we can do this. Can you see that all right? Yes. That's good, John. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Scott. And thank you, Scott. Scott has been texting me, he says, hey, John, if you have any trouble with this, I'll take it over for you. Don't worry, man, I've got your back. So I have the occasional technology problem here in my, my home office. So I'm glad that Scott's here to help with me. B. Um, I'm just going to be giving you a update on the um, status of the formalization of the Uglina International Network. And uh, these conferences that have been held for the last few years is actually a, a great metaphor in the, um, the evolution of the organization of the EIN, um, starting off with just some fundamental scientific collaborations and get togethers. And the first conference was like that. Uh, but um groups have come together and actually uh, been driving ahead the uh, activities of the organization in a much more organized fashion and the vision um, that uh, the organization is going to, to is uh, we call the formalization of the EIN and that's pulling together actually a um, creation of a nonprofit organization to manage the affairs of the organization um the uh, uh, it's critical uh, at this point in time to actually create an entity that will manage the affairs of the organization because there's so many opportunities that are being missed to establish agreements with other organizations and a lot of those uh, other organizations and funders and sponsors need to actually have a, an agreement with an official organization and not um, a loose collaboration of different institutions and individuals. So the, the vision is that uh, the EIN will eventually become a nonprofit organization, ideally with charitable status, which should open the door for donations um, and uh, some perhaps some larger international uh, UN related grants, uh, grant opportunities or other large uh, international philanthropic organizations. Um, as well as uh, we, <clears throat> we will, we'll, uh, we want to um, focus on um, also some advocacy and publication and communications and building awareness of the tremendous uh, value that Euglena offers. Um, it's just amazing how far uh, this uh, research has come, but all the way along. Uh, the, uh, more research is needed and um, we need to have a vehicle that will help expedite that process and the creation of a nonprofit entity 
called the Euglena International Network is the direction that the EIN will be going. So a policy from last year's presentation, uh, since then a policy document has been created. Uh, it's been reviewed by uh, the broad uh, spectrum of uh, active people in the EIN, the science committee, the executive committee, communications membership group, um, and there has been an approval in principle to move to um, a member, uh, for, uh, part of the formalization, we've got to have membership that is official, um, i.e. you sign up to be a member, um, whether that be an institution or whether that be an individual. Also critical in the early stages until the financial structure of the organization is established, we need to have a host uh, for the um, early stages of the EIN form, uh, organization, uh, formalized organization. And the uh, fortunately, the Earlham Institute has stepped forward to uh, raise its hand and made moves forward to um, be that uh, formal host of the organization. So um, the membership. Um, will be free to start with. And as part of the policy document that's been approved in principle, um, there is um, a direction to move to paid membership in the very variety of different categories of member membership. So it's going to be essential for the organization survival to actually have a paid membership program. Um, but at the moment in time, it'll you know the recruitment of uh, members will be free membership mem membership, and then move to a uh, uh, a fee for membership structure. And at that time, if those uh, who don't want to partake uh, in the organization uh, as a paid member uh, can uh, can um, leave, or you know just follow as uh, as in the general public. But there will be actually some major benefits to actually being a paid member in the EIN as we move forward. Um, the current activity is finding uh, and setting up an online platform to manage the membership administration, something that is easy to use, something that is low cost, something that is global, something that can handle payments systems uh, efficiently, uh, something for an organization that's largely driven by volunteers, so that the customer service and help and coaching and uh, activities of the of the on the platform to help the organization is uh, is essential. So uh, we're we're in a very close stage of moving ahead to uh, one organization who has uh, all these benefits, and more will be shared as uh, in the not too distant future about what uh, what the plan is there. So benefits of membership. This is not uh, the full list, but. Uh, I keep thinking of uh, American Express. I don't know if anybody there has got an Amex front of the line advantage. Uh, I take full advantage of mine to get to buy tickets uh, for concerts and theater uh, two days before it goes, the tickets go on sale to the general public. So that's the essence of member, the prime essence of the benefits of membership in the EIN and, and a paid membership is early info about research activity and opportunities, collaboration, a chance as a member to collaborate with other members in committees and groups, build your networking, also a chance behind in the, um, in the member, member membership section of uh, the website, um, shared uh, discussion and dialogues and blogs and forums about uh, key is issues and critical issues. And also members will be eligible for uh, EIN awards and prizes. Uh, there will be more details in the membership drive as to what the benefits of membership are so people can consider, consider all the uh, positives of being a paid member of the EIN. Um, so, um, you know, the, the move ultimately is gonna be a self-funded nonprofit corporation. And, um, the funding uh, for the organization will come from uh, multiple sources, the membership drive, whether that be for membership uh, categories, whether that be for research institutions uh, with a bundle, um, higher 
higher cost but bundled uh, or individuals with lower costs and actually probably with students um, a, a very low low cost to be a member. Uh, industry partnerships can be for, uh, managed through, um, if they're involved with an international research collaboration, um, industry partnerships can be done with the EIN organization who will coordinate the institutions and researchers that may be working on an industry funded project. And there's also the opportunity with, a, you know, if it's a chair, especially if it's a charitable status organization that we can get donations and other grants and and also there may be some other um, money or revenue generation opportunities such as uh, journals, et cetera, that uh, the organization can look at. And that is the presentation. Um, I'm not sure if there's time for questions, Aaron, but happy to answer any questions. Thanks, John. Um, if there are any questions, we have a, a few minutes for questions. Um, and uh, I'll share the presentation uh, in PDF for those who had uh, difficulty viewing it um, after the conference. Um, any questions? So one one of the questions is from from Lynn uh, asking about why there's a need to have a separate organization and infrastructure uh, rather than have it as a section of another um, protospace society. Well, uh, focus, I guess, more than anything else, focus on the uh, euglena organism and the potential of uh, euglena, especially uh, uh, so much to be discovered with the Aglena organism, organism and the research is a critically important, particularly when we see the um, um, uh, advantages that uh, some of the compounds that are extracted from Aglena and what their applications are in, in food, nutraceuticals, industry applications, water purification, the list goes on and on. It's just such a remarkable organism that uh, that much of the world uh, does not even know about it. And I uh, think if there's an organization just specifically on Euglena, um, it's, um, it's going to highlight uh, what this organism, uh, advantages of this organism is and, and what's, what's happening and, and uh, attract more industry attention to it uh, for product development, uh, attract more researchers into the doing um, fundamental research in this area. So that's the prime reason I think that it's being looked at the setup uh, as a separate organization, but this separate organization is fully plans to have uh, strategic partnership agreements with any other uh, associated or scientific, scientific re relevant uh, organizations. And that process has already been started with some of these organizations. So it's, um, Yes, stand alone, but also still fully collaborative with other organizations in the protist community, research community. Um, Lynn, did you still wanna ask a question? I see that your, your hand is raised. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. I, I guess I'm a little bit more ecumenical having worked on most of the protists and been involved in the various organizations. And it's, it's a tall order when you want more membership. And these online meetings have been fabulous. I've enjoyed them immensely. But setting up new journals, setting up societies, dues, all, websites, all these things take time and money and dedication. And I'm just worried that it further fragments our community um, and that you then have this overlap in which meeting should I go to. And I really would urge you strongly to look to see whether there's some way to become a formal section in PSA or protozoologists or, or some other society, because I think you're, you're just sort of asking for a whole new political infrastructure that sort of wastes, to, in my mind, time and money and, and resources that could be better spent, um, you know, by, by not duplicating efforts of other societies. I, you know, obviously whatever whatever everyone feels is is fine but 
you know, these arguments can also be made for Chlamydomonas and Tetrahymena and Paramecium and, you know, everything else. And we then end up with a very fragmented community. Well, I, I can't really speak to that, <laughs> but uh, I understand your point. Thank you, Lynn. Um, is there anybody else that has any questions? Uh, we have we have one minute till, um, I think in the interest of time, we have a pretty busy uh, second session. Uh, we'll move on. Um, and now we have a moment to uh, where Kemen will be uh, introducing the photo contest award winner. So um, I'm gonna hand uh, the mic back over to uh, Jeff from Kemen to make, um, to make those announcements. Hi, Scott. Sorry, I just got kicked out of the Zoom. So is it, are you saying that it's time to do the photo contest award? I just heard the very tail end of you. Yeah, it is time to do the photo contest award. Thanks. All right, well, we're happy to do that here. Hang on a second. Boom. Okay, well, I think you can I think you can probably see that um, this year's best photo went to, and I'm gonna butcher the name. So uh, Dr. Bozina Zacharis. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm really surprised, but what That's a, Thank you. <laughs> it's a very beautiful mosaic. And so while we have you, I guess, would you like to um, make a comment on how you made the uh, mosaic? And um, yeah, it's a very beautiful picture. Thanks a lot. I, um, the very numerous cells uh, belong to Euglena Ehrenbergi, so it's the only species for which we can get any sequence, to be honest. So it's very enig enigmatic species, very common, but we can't get any sequence from it. So it's called Euglena, but probably it belongs to some other uh, genus like Discoplastis or Plexiglena. And the other small ones are Lepocinkis. So. Okay. Well, very beautiful. Well, we'll encourage everyone to um, submit some more photos for next year's photo contest, assuming that we'll keep the prize going. Um, so thank you very much for your inspiration and a very nice photo this year. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and Bozena is the two-time winner of the photo, photo award. Um, so congratulations, and another beautiful image um, that, you've, uh, that you've shared with us. So thanks again. Uh, so we are now at the break um, portion of the first session. Uh, I just want to uh, send out a reminder or an update. Um, this morning I sent out a conference response form uh, to get feedback on this year's conference. We're always looking to improve um, and make the conference um, as best as of an experience for everybody. So I sent that out by, by email. If you could fill that out by the end of the week, it'd be very much appreciated. Um, I'll also be sharing uh, recordings of the conference um, after the conference. We'll post those on the Ugolina International website as well. Uh, with that, I think uh, we, can, we can break and we'll reconvene um, in about 15 minutes. Thanks everybody.
Hello, Scott. Hi, Mafazer. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly, perfectly well. Um, are you going to do some karaoke for us? <laughs> that will be for the next session in person. Okay. Um, we're going to get started in a minute, and we are going to change the order uh, to allow um, Elodie some time. Oh, she looks like she's arrived. She has arrived. Okay, never mind. Um, we aren't going to change the order. Elodie has arrived in the nick of time. For those, um, uh, Elodie just had convocation and ran from Convocation Hall at University of Toronto all the way to her office to give the presentation. So uh, <laughs> I'll give her a second for her heart rate to come back down and equilibrate. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to um, introduce the next. The next uh session moderator uh for the final session of the this year's euglena international network conference um uh i'd like to introduce uh, dr mafazer shah uh, mafazer is a microbial biotechnologist with over 15 years of research development and commercialization experience uh he completed his phd in japan uh, worked as a postdoc in south korea and a research professor in China. He also led a team of researchers to develop a large scale, scale microalgae system for high value compounds like astaxanthin uh, in Malaysia and shellfish larvae production in uh, Vancouver, Canada. Um, so um, Mafazer has been working uh, as a scientist at Novelgen to develop Eugelina cell maintenance, preservation, seed training, cultivation technology uh, with other microbes. And with, with that, Mavazir, I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Um, good luck. Thanks. Thank you, Scott, for nice introduction. Um, yeah, I would like to thank um, EIN for giving me this opportunity to be a moderator of the last session of the last day. And welcome once again. So, this is the last session about the translation and commercialization. Um, as you know, that the making money is very important for everybody. And then whatever we talk about the England, at the end of the day, we'll actually think about how we can make money um, by selling the product of, out of England. So in this session, there will be three uh, presentations. Um, the first uh, presenter will be from the uh, Toronto University, Dr. Elodie Paspor. So, um, after, uh, like in his presentation, there will be a, a five minutes reminder before we finish it. So, please be prepared, like, and maintain the time, uh, go with the time because we have the time limitations. And after all those presentations, we will have the, uh, the questions and comment sessions. And please um, uh, feel free to write your comments in the comment, uh, in the in the chat box um, if, you, if you have any questions or comments and then we will talk about this uh, at the end of the presentations. So Dr. Elodie Fosford, uh, if you are ready, please click, feel free to share your uh, screen and then start, it can go ahead with the presentation. Dr. Elodie. Okay. Can you confirm that you can hear me well and you can see my screen? Looks I can see you well. I can hear the screen. I can see the screen. <laughs> you can hear the screen. <laughs> I love it. Great. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move this here. Um, OK, well, thank you so much um, for the introduction and for uh, inviting me for uh, this conference today. So today I'll talk about um, not directly on how to make money, uh, though I would love to see how this can unfold uh, from this project. Um, but today I'll talk about the potential to use Euglena gracilis for uh, water treatment. And specifically, I'll talk one, about one contaminant that we've been studying uh, more in details. 
So as a quick introduction to the work that we're doing in our group, um, in general, I'm interested in contaminants that come from human activities, whether it's in industrial areas, uh, agricultural areas, urban areas, and this includes pesticides, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, and um, many other chemicals and materials that we use every day find their way to our aquatic ecosystems. And so we find some of them at the very low nanogram per liter concentrations, for example, some pharmaceuticals that end up in large rivers. Um, but some contaminated sites have very high milligram per liter con concentrations, such as chlorinated benzenes next to a chemical factory that use them to produce other chemicals. Um, just to give an example on uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, so usually we use this acronym PPCP in Ontario, which is where we are. In our raw wastewater, we find a lot of different, these different pharmaceuticals and personal care products. I've highlighted a few here that we've studied in our work with microalgae. Um, and triclosan is the one I'll focus on today, which is an antibacterial molecule. And we can find it on an average concentration of two to three micrograms per liter. And that's quite high. So the presence of these contaminants in the environment can have deleterious impact, not only on human and ecosystem health, but for the economy as well. They can generate biodiversity losses and be at the origin of many cancers, cardiovascular and respiratory disease, and affect the endocrine and reproductive systems. Evaluating their impact on the economy is obviously much more difficult. There was a study in 2009 by Pimentel that showed that in the US, um, the total environmental and social cost of pesticide is about $10 billion per year. And when you compare to how much you spend every year in the U.S. to buy pesticide, $12 billion per year is quite interesting to put these numbers in perspective. And at a study on endocrine disrupting chemicals estimated that the total health and economic cost of these chemicals in European rivers was about $200 billion per year. Another kind of indirect cost of the presence of such contaminants in the environment is that in order to get rid of them in drinking water production plants or in uh, wastewater treatment plants, we need to implement advanced water treatment technologies. And these are expensive to implement and they include things like activated carbon, ozone treatment, reverse osmosis, uh, UV treatment, uh, and increase in cost that ultimately will find on our water bill. And so I believe that in this context, there's a need for cost-effective water treatment solutions in order to intercept these contaminated flows before they reach our aquatic system. And so this is kind of in this area that the research in our group fits. So we talk about passive water treatment systems or ecological engineering systems, and these are either biogeochemical hotspots like repairing zones or restored or created wetlands, so constructed wetlands, lagoons, um, but sometimes they can be more engineered and you can go all the way to the context kind of a, this talk is more the high railed algal ponds. And so they tend to mimic natural landscape elements. Um, but they are designed so that one of their function is enhanced, in our case, the function of their natural ability at improving water quality, but without compromising other function. So in order to design this kind of lagoon or wetlands or a hybrid algal pond, you first need to evaluate if yes or no, they are able to remove contaminants. So you can use black box approaches where you compare the inlet and outlet concentration or mass of a given contaminant for that system in order to demonstrate if there is or not any potential. But to optimize the system, we first need to understand what are the hydrological and um, um, transfer and transformation mechanisms, biogeochemical uh, processes that govern the fate of these contaminants. And so we need to use this kind of gray box approaches where we try to characterize this transfer and transformation mechanisms. So what I mean by transfer is that a molecule that's initially in water can absorb onto solid surfaces like sediments, soil, plant material, suspended particles and can settle down. They might also disorb. They might reach the air via volatilization. So it's kind of a phase transfer. Whereas transformation processes are those that involve the breaking or forming of chemical bonds. And this can be done abiotically like photolysis or biotically, such as with the action of bacteria or algae. So in this talk, 
we are working, um, I'll focus on triclosan. We worked on other molecules, but, but to, to tell a kind of a complete story, I, I've decided to focus on triclosan for today. Triclosan is an antibacterial molecule that's incorporated into many household products. And um, it has um, quite a high hydrophobic property. So it tends to accumulate in the sludge of wastewater treatment plants. It bioaccumulates through the food chain. It's known to be toxic and it's known to form toxic byproducts, including some that are uh, highly regulated that like dioxins and 2,4-dichlorophenol. So triclosan is this molecule here, and you can see these three chlorine atoms and benzene rings. It's never great when you have this kind of properties on the molecule. And it actually has a pKa at around 8.2. And so when the pH is low, or at least lower than its pKa, triclosan is mainly in this um, phenol form within OH that's protonated here. Whereas <clears throat> at higher pH, um, this uh, proton goes away and um, triclosan bears a negative charge on the phenolate group. So that has important implication on its environmental fate. Okay, so in this work, we looked at um, Overall, we looked at many different processes that affect triclosan. We looked at its phototransformation and also we looked at its kind of microbial transformation. Uh, what we found is that in some previous work by Shirley Lam published in ESNT 2019, we um, were able to identify the condition in the soil organic carbon concentration in pH of the water and in nitrate concentration that resulted in the best compromise for two things removing triclosan via phototransformation as fast as possible, but at the same time limiting the accumulation of toxic byproducts. And so these conditions were those that had low dissolved of organic carbon concentration to avoid light screening, but also high pH. And that high pH was the in interesting thing that we found and that was you know, also known in the literature. And that led us to hypothesize that we could probably use algae or some sort of algae treatment unit ahead of some other phototransformation treatment unit in order to naturally raise the pH as algae through photosynthesis take up the CO2 and tend to increase the pH of the water so that we would have then and downstream the best conditions for triclosan phototransformation. So we started to look at algae and we first work with um, chlorella vulgaris and Solidesmus oblicus, so two different types of algae species. And we found that yes, some of them are able to take up triclosome. Both of them were able to take up some triclosome and Solidesmus oblicus in particular was able to transform it, to biotransform it to triclosome O sulfate. And that was the first time that we found that this molecule triclosome O sulfate this transformation product was um, produced by algae. And we also found that when there is enough algae in the right condition, then they were also obviously able to increase the pH of the water. And so um, then we started to talk with um, NobleGen and um, we, we worked with them and um, they were very nice to uh, provide us with some of their Eucalina gracilis strand Z. And um, in a further project by Shirley Lam, uh, we looked at the potential of Eugrena gracilis to uptake triclosan and transform it in some algae reactors. And that objective was to investigate reaction mechanisms and then to evaluate the relative contribution of different reaction pathways. So this is the work that I'll present today. And if you want more details, obviously I'm always happy to take any questions later or by email, but you can also check out the published paper by Shirley Lam uh, from this year in Stoughton. So what did we do? By we, I mean Shirley, my PhD student, Eric, a master's student, and they received help from many others. Why? Because they set up many reactor conditions and they tested different light condition, different media, and the presence or absence of eugalina. So these reactors were lit either with white light, a mixture of incandescent and fluorescent bulbs, also 16 hour on and eight hour off. We also tested red light with a wavelength that was lower, and we also had kind of controls under dark condition. The reason we tested red light is because, as I said, triclosan is not to phototransform. And so we wanted a control where we would not have phototransformation of triclosan, or not much of it, but we could still have hopefully some growth of algae. 
Then we tested for media water. So we tested molecule water, like in a way to have some control. Nutrient medium to make sure there was a control where the algae would have everything they need to grow. And then we used some real wetland water and then an autoclaved, so a sterilized version of that wetland water. And then finally, we had uh, um, reactors with algae, obviously, and then some without algae. And so all of these many reactors were done in replicates, and all of these many replicates were sampled over time, of, over about a month. And we skipped samples for many different types of analysis. So it was a lot of work for the students to do this because we wanted to try and have all of this uh, kind of control conditions. So I'm going to show you some results. And so, of course, there's a lot on this graph, but please stay with me. I'm going to, I'm going to explain how it works. And the next few slides will also have the same kind of layout for the graphs. So you can see that there are six of them. The top row here will be for reactors containing algae, whereas the bottom row will be for the reactors that had no algae in them. And then you have three columns. The first one is for the continuous white light. The second one is for the reactors under red light condition, and the last one is for the reactor under uh, dark condition. So the first, and then finally, there are four <laughs> curves on this. Um, oops, I'm trying to move this zoom. If I can move this, okay, here. Um, you have four colors, four curves on the edge of this graph. Uh, the black one will be for the growth media. Uh, the red one is for the autoclaved wetland water. The blue one is for the wetland water. And then the, the gray one is for the millicule water. Let's just take a look at the millicule water just to start with. What you can see here is that the pH, these are pH data just to start simple. The pH was constant over time, whether or not there was algae, but we did use a buffer in this experiment and there were not nutrients in the water for the algae to grow. So it, it, com it completely makes sense. In the wetland water and in the autoclave wetland water, we did have a slight pH increase um, at the beginning, uh, especially when algae were present, um, but then it kind of stabilized and, and uh, after a few days. And the pH was lower than 8, which means that less than 50% of the trichosome was in this anionic form, anionic form, which is the one that is uh, more prone to phototransformation. Um, and then uh, during with the growth media, which is shown in black here, there was plenty of nutrients available and DRG grew very well. And therefore, uh, this is not surprising that we saw a, a significant pH increase. So that demonstrate that algae were indeed um, able to raise the pH when the right conditions were there for them. So let's now look at the triclosan concentration. So here's the same kind of layout as I mentioned above, but I'm showing the concentration of triclosan in microampolier versus time since the start of the experiment. And many data here, so let me just start with some of them. When we did not have algae and in the red, uh, and dark red light and dark condition, the concentration of triclosan was mostly constant. And indeed, we don't expect any photo transformation. So there's no reason why it would decrease drastically. Uh, we also found that the concentration of triclosan in the wetland water shown in blue was always lower than the concentration of triclosan in the autoclave wetland water. So that sterilized version. So the only difference between these two types of water was that the wetland water contained some bacteria that were not killed by uh, sterilization, sterilization. And so there, this shows that there is a role for bacteria to take up and remove some of the triclosan, especially during this kind of simulated nighttime, nighttime conditions. Um, let's not look at the same kind of reactor where there's no algae, so that all the control, but under white light uh, conditions. There, indeed, we observed that the concentration of triclosome decreased sharply over time uh, down to uh, below detection level, which suggests, uh, as expected, that phototransformation dominated. And even if the pH was not you know, uh, the most um, the, the highest and therefore the best condition for phototransformation. It triclosan photolysis did happen, but it could have happened at a faster rate has the pH been higher. Let's look again at this white light condition, but now by adding algae. So when we added algae to the reactor, we also found you know, similar uh, decrease of concentration of triclosan over time. Um, so very similar to what we found, whether or not there was algae. So algae did not drastically help here with the um, removal of triclosan. However, they had some effect. 
if you look at the blue and red curve, so that kind of wetland or autoclave wetland water, we actually found that the uh, transformation genetics were slightly lower in this condition with algae compared to those where there was no algae. And this is very likely due to a light screening effect of the algae. In the growth media condition, which is shown in black, it looks like the tracheal removal was faster during this kind of daytime simulated condition. And we suspect that this is because this is an, an ideal environment for algae to grow. And uh, we suspect that we also had some of this uptake and transformation of triclosan thanks to the algae. Uh, finally, when you compare again the blue and the red uh, curves, and you see again that the blue one is mostly lower than the red one, suggesting again a role for the bacteria in the wetland water in the removal of triclosan. I'm now adding <clears throat> what's happening uh, when algae are present, but during the red light and the dark condition. So kind of simulating uh, nighttime condition. And here in general, the triclosan concentration decreased less fast than under white light condition, suggesting that indeed there was more photolysis during the day uh, than, um, than, you know, during the night, obviously. But it did decrease a little bit, suggesting that there was some role of the algae at night time for triclosan uptake and transformation. So I want to focus a little bit on that graph. Um, so this is the one with algae under continuous white light condition. And I will focus on that wetland water, so the blue curve. And the reason is because, so this is basically what best simulate what we would have in the field in a lagoon or in a high railed algal pond. And so what we did is that uh, we looked at transformation products using high resolution mass spectrometry. There's so much advances in high resolution mass spec now that we can look for many different masses. Um, and we look for about 30 known transformation products of triclosan. We found several of them and I'll just want to highlight a few of them. First, we found uh, these two here, C25, H29, CL3014, and the second one here, only in conditions where um, there was algae in molecule water, so we didn't expect any uh, microbial degradation. The, for the first one, it was under dark conditions, so it could not have been due to photolysis, so we suspect that this product was due to algae uh, transformation. And same for this one, because it was found um, only when algae were present and not in the corresponding control without algae. But I want to highlight the triclosangol sulfate. Triclosangol sulfate was that molecule that was previously reported only for um, back, mac, microbial degradation by bacteria in wastewater. But in our previous work, we found that Sanidesmus oblicus was able to transform triclosan to triclosangol sulfate. And here we showed the same with uh, Glena gracilis. So this graph shows the concentration of triclosan decrease over time in the water phase here. And for the water phase, the increase and then further decrease of triclosan or sulfate concentration. So this molecule was produced and it didn't accumulate in the water, it was further transformed. We also found that in the algae phase, suggesting that there was some uptake of triclosan and uptake or formation within the algae of triclosan or sulfate. I'd say that in general, <clears throat> Uh, less than 16% of the initial triclosan was actually uptaken by the algae as per our estimation. But maybe under other conditions, this is something that we could uh, further increase. Okay, I want to continue and show you uh, kind of um, the last step of this project, which was to try and, and figure out the relative contribution of the different processes that could explain this decrease in triclosan concentration that I was showing. So in this graph, the so same you know, layout as usual, uh, with the algae at the top, without algae at the bottom, and the tree light condition. I'm going to show you these five pathways that we were um, uh, suspecting with, and that we could estimate with our different controls. In green, we'll have algae uptake and transformation. In blue, microbial uptake and transformation, so due to the bacteria in the wetland water. Phototransformation will be in red. Adsorption to the glass, so that's kind of an experimental artifact, will be in purple. And then organic adsorption, by this we mean adsorption onto any dissolved organic carbon that's present in the autoclave wetland water. And then, um, so we'll have this estimated proportion and then next to each of them, I'll show you the measured uh, removal of triclosan. Um, thank you for the five minutes left. Um, 
And then finally, each of these graphs will have the four uh, type of water, the wetland water, so WE is wetland water, or autoclave wetland water, molecular water, and medium, and growth medium. Okay, so here are our data, and let me just break them uh, down for you. Let's look at the millicule water first. So this is what I'm showing you here. What we found for millicule water is that um, adsorption to the glass actually dominated. And this, um, and this is confirmed, and this is not um, unusual in the sense that there was nothing in this millicule water, right? There was no bacteria, uh, there was algae at some point, but the pH was quite low. There was no photolysis in these conditions here. The pH was quite low, so triclosome tend to absorb more under these conditions and phototransform less. But obviously when light and algae were there, then we did see a, a contribution to um, photo, of phototransformation and algae uptake and transformation. Under the autoclave wetland water condition, so in this case, it, we didn't have any microbes, triclosan was mainly affected by phototransformation as long as sunlight was there. Whereas during kind of nighttime condition, algae uptake had a significant role in the uh, triclosan removal. And if we now look at the version of this wetland that also had the microbe, we actually were able to estimate similar results, except that bacteria also played a role in the transformation of triclosan. Finally, this medium growth condition where those that led to um, the still a lot of adsorption due to the pH of the water and also some phototransformation. So just to conclude, um, I wanted to show you that um, there is potential for eucalyptic grasslands to uptake and potentially transform some of these pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Here, uh, focusing on triclosan was quite of a, a tricky choice. Triclosan is a molecule of interest that is banned in many countries um, and might be banned in other countries soon. So it is a molecule of interest, but it was tricky to work with it just because it has this potential for phototransformation. But in spite of that, the algae did contribute uh, for its uptake and transformation. And I think there's more research that's needed for sure to optimize the condition of the water chemistry and the operation condition of such high-rail algal pond that could further um, transform uh, up for the further uptake and transformation of molecules like triclosan. I'm going to stop here. I'd like to thank Noble Gen uh, and Answer for supporting this work, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasper. And um, I'm pretty sure that this, with this nice presentation, you will have a lot of questions at the end. And um, yeah, I have, I have some questions too, but I'm not going to ask you right, right now. But probably at the end, I will have some questions. And um, and this like very much thank I'm very much thankful for like having this kind of uh, like presentation. And I hope that this will end up with the. Uh, um, uh, making a prototype or something like any kind of device or equipment in the future to to help in the, the bioaccumulation, uh, contamination issues and all those things. So the, our next, okay, thank you. Please uh, stop sharing the screen. Uh, we'll go for the next presenter. And um, the next presenter would be Dr. Jiang Jiang from Noble Gen. And he is the senior uh, geneticist is my best friend and colleague. And he will talk about, uh, he's recently developed some cell lines, um, which is very important. And he um, and he's very hardworking. And he's working uh, like 24 hours almost with this Iglan Agresilis and uh, developing some new cell lines and new strains. So please, Jiang, if you're ready, uh, go ahead with the screen sharing and start uh, with the presentation. Jiang. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, for that, for your kind of introduction. Also, thanks everybody for your great presentations and all the uh, nice organizations. And, uh, everything goes well so far for conference. Uh, today, uh, Mafuza, uh, can you see my uh, presentation now? Yeah, I can see your presentation, Jiang. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to introduce some of our uh, discoveries and uh, some of our, our progress uh, about the some cell lines, new cell lines developed at the Novagy. One pair today specifically, I will introduce 
uh, a pair of uh, primarily free sibling cell lines developed through the ribonuclear protein complex delivered CRISPR gene editing of the uh, uh, beta glucan synthesis like gene, this is the perimenal synthesis gene in Euclidean glycerics. And uh, many people have contributed and supported the, this uh, project as listed the, for the major contributors here. And uh, the second slide, just a brief uh, introduction about the Nova gene. Nova gene is a back a technology company founded in 2013 by Adam Nova and uh, is located in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. And uh, the company and, uh, is producing the nutritious, sustainable, and non GMO superior Euglena protein and beta glucan ingredients and the products. We are relentlessly seeking solutions through scientific breakthroughs. One of such scientific breakthroughs was investigating the applications of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing systems and in the Euclidean glycerics for very different, for all kinds of various products. And the third slide, and my further use of you see the slides are moving, yeah? Yes. Okay. Right. Very, okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. The uh, current, the third slide shows that uh, we what we uh, have done for some gene editing using the DNA-free CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing systems to edit the permanent synthesis gene, the e, uh, EGGSL2 gene, you can get the series, the white type strain Z. Uh, you know there are some uh, important metabolic systems in Euclidean gracilis cell, but some of the important uh, metabolic systems are not essential. Therefore, we can take advantages uh, to uh, manipulate, to uh, edit some genes, in, uh, major genes involved in such uh, metabolic pathways then to perform the metabolic engineering to produce the ideal products we wanted you know, from Euclidean glycerics. One of the projects we are working on is you know, the uh, parameter free cell line development. Then you can see here there are three figures. The first figure is the regular uh, white type cells of Euclidean glycerics. You can see uh, in the cells, there are many of the granules. They are the beta glucan, uh, unique beta glucan paramelin granules in the cells. The, in the white type cells, the Euclidean uh, glycerin produce the paramelin in the uh, cells average around 2.5 micrometer long. And then we treat such a uh, white type cells using the CRISPR-Cas9 system and uh, to edit uh, the uh, permanent synthesis gene, CSR2. After three days and, uh, 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 after the CRISPR treatment, we can see many cells and uh, have very huge permanent granules, but the numbers of the permanent granules reduced a lot. The uh, average uh, length of such uh, permanent granules uh, in the treated cells are uh, larger than seven micrometer long. Then from there, we select the single cells and uh, continue the observation. Seven days after the single cell selection, some cell, single cells de uh, developed as a, a homogeneous permanent free cells. Now from there, from there we further select single cells for cell line for homozygous uh, cell line development. For the white type, and uh, we predicted based on the behavior, we predicted they are the genetically homozygous for the white type genotype, and the middle one the, they were supposed to be the uh, heterozygous genetically for the uh, primary synthesis gene. Then for the permanent free cells, 
the, they are the uh, homozygous the, for the edited version of the paramelin free cell gene. Then a pair of such paramelin free cell sibling lines were developed in the ethanol gene. The, we call it sibling because these two cell lines in the, uh, are derived from a common mother single cell and originated from the CRISPR treatment. Then you can see uh, we uh, named that these two new cell lines as B2 and B3. B2 cells don't produce any chlorophyll and the light observed on B4. Then the B3 cells produce chlorophyll and they turn green and their light also observed on B4. And uh, the white type cells produce much more uh, chlorophyll and uh, turn green faster and the light also observed on default. You can see uh, the uh, uh, phenotype the differences. Then under constant light conditions, when we cultured such cell lines in the larger volume in the, in the uh, flasks and with uh, six replicates for each cell line, we can see the B2 cells doesn't produce any chlorophyll indicating the B2 cells had lost the, the chloroplast functionality. And uh, besides, uh, it's lost the paramelin biosynthesis capacity as well. And the, but uh, the sibling new cell line, B3 cell line, only lost the paramelin biosynthesis capacity, still produce chlorophyll and to the uh, similar level as the red type. Then in order to know What's the molecular uh, mechanism control, uh, con uh, that controls the uh, differences between the new cell lines and the, the white type? Now we did sequencing around the CRISPR targeting site to see what happened in the genome and of, uh, of the new cell lines. Any Message, I heard message. Okay, so the, you can see the uh, white type has a lot of granules, paramelin granules, and uh, the paramelin free cell lines, B2, doesn't have any uh, paramelin granules in the cells. They look like a very different uh, species, but the, gene, uh, the sequence results show that the B2, B3 uh, have the same uh, six base pair division in their genome around the uh, uh, CRISPR, CRISPR target site. And that six base pairs are E frame, that's a E frame division, doesn't destroy the gene, uh, but uh, uh, lost two amino acids and, uh, for the gene. Therefore, Based on the six base pair deletion, we developed the uh, uh, CRISPR knockout markers specifically to detect the six pair deletion in the, in the genome of the new cell lines. And such a, a marker can be used to differentiate the new cell lines from the white type, also can differentiate the new cell lines we developed from any other. Uh, uh, cell lines or any other nucleocrasis strains. We investigated the uh, 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 knockout genes transcript levels and the, for the uh, uh, under uh, four different uh, uh, fermentation conditions. And then we noticed that the GSL2 gene transcript dramatically reduce in B2 in, and B3 cell lines compared to the white type. And uh, this figure I just uh, uh, show that the um, relative gene expression of the paramedicine gene and their mixed trophic and the aerobic condition and uh, uh, under constant light. You can see at the early stages days of the culture, the B2, B3 cells Although the gene was knocked out, but still had some transcript levels detected, but much lower than white type. And, uh, but along with the time cost and the light, 
the light doesn't favor the uh, perimetral biosynthesis. Therefore, the uh, late stages of the growth, uh, all the uh, uh, cell lines have a lower expression levels for the uh, perimetral synthesis gene. We also uh, uh, investigated the uh, gene expression levels of the chloroplast specific gene, CCSA. This gene is involved in chlorophyll biosynthetics. And uh, uh, our results uh, show that no any such uh, 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 transcription uh, for this gene, for the chloroplast specific gene uh, detected in B2 cells but they are highly expressed in B3 and the white type. And uh, compared to the white type, the new cell lines and uh, ex exhibited absolutely unique phenotypes. And, uh, for example, they don't have the perimelin granules formed in the cells. Also the total proteins, total lipids, and also the carbohydrates were dramatically uh, changed. And uh, we did some uh, 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 analytical composition analysis and for the crude protein, now as shown in the example in the table, that the P2 can produce up to as high as 77% of crude protein uh, and in the dry biomass. Also for the permanent content as shown on the uh, figure on the uh, right side, you can see the B2, B3 uh, cell lines almost don't produce any perimelin. And then the white compared to the uh, white type, the white type also produce uh, the highest perimelin under the heterotrophic aerobic condition, but under anaerobic condition or under light produce much less perimelin. Now we also uh, investigated the uh, uh, pure protein content and our total lipids in the new cell lines compared to the white type and there are four different uh, con uh, culture conditions. We can see that these two new cell lines have always a much higher protein, pure protein than the uh, white type. And, uh, uh, but for the lipids, and uh, the new cell lines only produce higher lipids than the white type under hydrotrophic and aerobic conditions. And uh, under anaerobic conditions, favor the uh, lipid accumulation for all the cell lines. And uh, based on these results, we think there are a lot of potential applications for these uh, new cell lines. They can be used for teaching tools, for uh, academic research materials, and also for industry products. For example, they can be used as educational tools by, by uh, biology students in all different levels of uh, institutions. Also, they can be developed as a uh, micro pipes. And also, this pair of uh, cell lines uh, are ideal zero waste fermentation uh, cell lines for food, for beverage, or for feed product development because all the biomass media residues and uh, uh, even supernatant can be harvested and utilized. Now, so in addition, and using our uh, new cell lines, we can conquer the disadvantages of some uh, other heterologous protein expression pro uh, pl platforms for pharmaceutical productions. And, uh, from here, I would like to. Uh, uh, Thanks to uh, the uh, Nobelin team and uh, uh, Adam Noble, Scott Ferro, Katie, and uh, Hope, Cara, Laura, Carolyn, Denise, Phil, Shaji, Arima, Fuzer, Kendra, Elena, Michelle, Kelly, Tracy, Steve, Kevin, and many of them contributed and supported our projects because this is just one of our projects. We have uh, multiple projects. And going on in, the, uh, in progress. And also, uh, also thanks a lot to uh, the, our collaborators, Professor New Emery, and uh, for long many years support uh, for uh, our research uh, at Trent. 
uh, university. Also, he's a lab member. Also, thanks to various uh, Savelle and his lab members. And uh, uh, we also uh, had a lot of uh, collaborations and, uh, uh, and uh, both of them allowed us to use their uh, 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 lot of resources in the lab and uh, uh, give us a lot of support. From here, I would like to uh, thank you all for, and, uh, for your attention and welcome any questions. And uh, thanks very much. Have Thank you, day. Dr. Jiong. We'll have a lot of questions at the end of the presentation. I hope <laughs> everybody enjoyed this presentation. And um, yeah, so next presenter would be our very own Dr. Shiki Yong from Nobelgen. And she will be introducing us um, beta glucan isolates, um, uh, which is the, one of the very important products from the Eugleva. And Jiong, please stop your um, sharing your screen. And then I would uh, request Dr. Sh Shiki to take over and then start uh, sharing Shiki's screen. Shiki, are you ready? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, but uh, yeah, we can see the yeah, screen. Okay, well. can you see me now? Yeah, you are right. You're okay, How, uh, can you go, see my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present the, uh, 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 sorry. Today I'm going to present the uh, uh, potential application of pickling emulsion uh, prepared with Eugenia beta gluten isolate. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit background of uh, Lobogen and then I will introduce the oil in water emulsion system, uh, followed by Eugenia beta gluten isolate. Uh, then I will talk about the long dairy analog products. And finally, I will give a summary of this presentation. Uh, Lobogen has technology platform of efficiently growing and manipulating a microorganism called Eugenia gazelis. Uh, we have ingredients and plant-based products that can be used in food, uh, cosmetic, and pharmaceuticals. Our product has a superior nutritional quality, functional properties, and environment footprint. And before I talk about using our Eugenia beta gluten isolate to make pickling emulsion, uh, I would like to introduce the oil in water emulsion system. Uh, so the oil in water uh, emulsion system has been widely used in many commercial products, uh, such as food, uh, supplements, uh, personal care, cosmetic, detergent, and pharmaceutical industries. Uh, so there were two uh, oil in water emulsion systems. Uh, the classical emulsions uh, use monocular surfactant to uh, stabilize emulsion, while the uh, pickling emulsion holds solid particles on the in interface between two liquid phases, serving as the stabilizing agent. Uh, so what are the advantage of a uh, solid particle emulsion stabilizer? Uh, it can reduce the possibility of uh, coalescence, uh, giving higher stability to emulsions. And also it can give useful characteristics and uh, it has ability to form high internal phase emulsions. Uh, many of the solid particles have been used to uh, prepare pickling emulsion, uh, such as uh, silica, clay, wasp esters. So in our study, pyromyelin granules derived from uh, Eugenia was found to be uh, suitable to form pickling emulsion. Uh, here, uh, I want to give some background of, uh, about how we prepare Eugenia pyromyelin granule. Uh, so firstly, uh, Eugenia biomass is separated from bioreactors and the pyromyelin is separated from biomass. Then the uh, pyromyelin is spray dry or uh, freeze dry, and then we get the final product. Uh, the appearance of pyromyelin uh, is white, fine and free flowing powder. 
and its uh, flavor is very neutral. Uh, and the purity can be more than 95%. Uh, so the uh, water holding capacity and oil, oil holding capacity are about 1.3. And our primylon granules are naturally uh, derived and minerally processed. Uh, it's dietary fiber and it has the functions of immunity support and other potential health benefits. Uh, I want to give a quick introduce on uh, microcrystalline uh, cellulose. Uh, so it is widely used to make pectoline emulsion system. Uh, it can be used in food, cosmetics, and uh, pharmaceutical industries as emulsifier, binder, filter, or uh, viscosity regulator. Uh, so um, similar to Michael, uh, crystallized cellulose pickling emulsion, uh, BGI emulsion have the potential for uh, uh, encapsulation of uh, lipophilic compounds. Uh, Primalin granules are not only used as uh, emulsifier, but also encapsulated in emulsion micelles as nutrients. Uh, so the preparation of uh, pickling emulsions normally leads a, a high pressure homogenizer or with the assistance of uh, ultrasonic. But uh, the BGI emulsion can be prepared using uh, low energy mixing, uh, such as Vortex, or low power mixing homogenizer. Uh, and the inclusion level of microcrystalline uh, uh, cell loss is about 2.5% to 5%, uh, while the inclusion level of BGI in emulsion system uh, can reach up to 40%. And the, the, the preparation methods affect the formation of the BGI pickling emulsion, uh, such as materials acting sequence, mixing force, different sample effects, and uh, oil incubation time. Uh, we also studied uh, the emulsions that bleed, uh, that bleed, uh, specifically uh, under different uh, conditions. Uh, we find uh, the BGI emulsion is stable uh, in low pH, uh, storage temperature ranging from 4 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and it is very stable at least for two weeks after preparation. So uh, we have tried different uh, ratio of uh, BGI oil and water to prepare BGI emulsion. Uh, it gives different texture and cream-like mouth feeling. Uh, some of them are like uh, milk, some of them are like uh, cream, different kinds of yogurt and uh, cheese. So uh, this indicated that uh, the BGI pickling emulsion system can be used in non dairy analog products. Uh, here are two products that uh, were made with BGI, water, oil, protein, other emulsifier, uh, hydrocolors, and flavors. And I want to summarize the, uh, the presentation, uh, like the uh, Michael uh, crystallized cellular pickling emulsion. Uh, the BGI pickling emulsion have the potential for uh, encapsulation of uh, lipophilic compounds that can be used in food, uh, cosmetic, pharmaceutical industry. And the uh, formation of uh, Eugenia uh, Baton Gooden isolate emulsion confer that uh, um, the possibility of encapsulation of uh, Lutians. Uh, also, BGI can be used as an emulsifier, binder, filler, or viscosity uh, regulator. And finally, I would like to thank uh, all the colleagues uh, that I have been working with uh, and uh, all the organizations that we have been collaborating with.
Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Shiki. Thank so, you. Yeah, so probably we'll have more questions at the end of this, uh, the session. Like we have one more presentation left. And that is about all about the, the commercial free product. And <laughs> it's kind of like showcasing things. Uh, so Shiki, please stop sharing your screen. And then we will go to the Kamin industry. Yeah. And the Kamin will be presenting about uh, the product uh, made by Kamin. And I'm I'm sure Dr. Geoff Horst is ready to present his product, uh, showcasing the product. Uh, Actually, Dr. Geoff, we'll, I'll be doing the presenting. I'm Brenda. Fons oh yeah, yeah, it's all right. I, yeah, Hi. don't worry. So you can okay. go ahead. So okay. yeah, so what's your name, by the way? Brenda. Brenda Fonsi. Brenda. Okay. So uh -huh. Brenda, welcome to the conference. I, I, I think we are seeing you first time here. Yes, yes I can see your slides. Okay, Please perfect. Go. All right, uh, so I'm with Kimmin. I uh, work closely with Dr. Jeff Hurst, um, and I work in our human nutrition and health division. So mostly I'm going to focus on how we have applied the uh, beta glucans derived from euglena gracilis for human health solutions. Uh, just as an introduction, Kimmin is based out of the Midwest in the US, uh, but we are a very global company. We have uh, facilities, uh, at least uh, salespeople in 90 countries, operation uh, plants in nine countries, and about 4,000 employees worldwide. We have a vision that we want to sustainably transform the quality of life every day for at least 80% of the population. Uh, and that's with our uh, products and services. So we have over 500 specialty ingredients that go into animal health, food health, and human health, uh, uh, to name a few of our platforms that we work in, uh, and very science-focused. We have at least, uh, I think now, three or 300 PhDs on staff, and we have about 500 patents on our ingredients, so we really, really invest heavily in understanding our ingredients. Right now, we are very focused on algae, um, and I don't need to convince this group, but we really feel like this is an ingredient of the future because of its renewable resource capabilities and really because of how it has the ability to solve a lot of the problems uh, and complex challenges that exist today. And I've really enjoyed hearing some of the research that has been going on and I'm uh, incredibly impressed with the variety of applications that are currently being worked on specifically with the euglena. So with uh, our perspective on the euglena gracilis, we are using this, um, uh, this in order to produce beta glucans for us that then can go into human health supplements, vitamins and products to help give, uh, give a mostly an immune health benefit. So that has a lot to do with the beta-1,3 glucan, which I'll, I'll talk very briefly about, but where we really have brought some innovation into this area is not only by developing a very efficient and sterile way to uh, produce large amounts of the euglena gracilis in a commercial setting, and we also have been able to patent that process to really be able to maximize the production and give the best benefit to our customers who can then go out and put it into products that are available for human consumption. As you may be aware, I know this is an extremely well-educated um, group that I'm speaking to. Uh, Beta-glucans have different structures depending on which source they come from. So the algae obviously is primarily a 1-3 structure. That structure has does seem to confer the highest immune health benefits. Um, binding to the dectin-1 receptor, for example, in the immune system happens via the 1-3 configuration. Yeast also produce beta-glucan. That's more of a 1-3-1-6 configuration. So still immune benefits, uh, potentially mostly through the 1-3 part of the beta-glucan that is found in yeast. Oats and barley have a 1-3-1-4 configuration and they have been shown to have more benefits for heart health. If you remember all the Cheerios uh, advertisements on uh, eating those for your heart benefits. And then finally, uh, different uh, uh, sources of cellulose typically have a 1-4 version, which really is more of the fiber and gut benefits. So what we focus on then is the uh, beta glucans coming from euglena gracilis and that 1-3 configuration. And that's where we have produced an ingredient that we call beta via. 
And this is what we sell out to businesses who are interested in providing human health benefits. Um, we uh, talk a little bit more about the ingredient itself, but we focus on several benefits as far as priming the immune system, fueling the growth of beneficial bacteria, and then also in intestinal bar barrier gut integrity. So both immune health and gut health. Uh, a nice quote from Jeff here, which is, he's such a pleasure to work with, and we really thank him for uh, really uh, providing uh, so much value to Kim in with this ingredient. But uh, basically, as you probably are well aware of uh, spending about a decade really trying to make the most efficient possible ingredient that is good for people, but also good for the environment. And this is something that's extremely important to Kim in. So as a company, we strive to abide by the principles of green chemistry, uh, which um, probably you're familiar with, but really talk about um, pr producing things with the uh, least amount of waste and especially hazardous waste and the most benefit to the environment. So we do really uh, follow those 12 principles and try and design products that reduce or eliminate uh, generation of hazardous substances. And for us, Beta Via is one that completely aligns with this philosophy and that we're really happy to be part of. So for the algae, some of the benefits that we really like to think about and why we are so excited about algae is for one, of course, it's good for the planet, consuming carbon dioxide, cleaning up the wastewater as the presentation, uh, um, three, three presentations ago, I think it was, had such a great example of, of how that can work. Um, it, the algae don't compete with agriculture for land use, so less uh, uh, footprint um, to produce something that has uh, great benefits. Um, it can be used for food, feed, fuel, and I know this is the group that's making that happen, so thank you all for um, all the work that you do on that. And um, you can produce a, a lot of material very quickly, so high yielding products, and I'll talk about the biomass here in a second. Uh, creates jobs. So just all around a lot of benefits to work with the algae. We, for us, our production is done in the Midwest. So this is our headquarters here in Iowa. I'll show you a little bit here of our solar panels we just installed. And then we have the fermentators located in Michigan. So all of our production is done in the Midwest. Um, we as a company uh, talk about a triple bottom line, healthy people, healthy planet, healthy business. So we really do have a whole sustainability team. We don't just talk the talk. So we are working really hard to reduce our footprint as quickly as possible. Um, we really align that with our vision of, of improving people's lives and we feel the sustainability is a big part and a big component of that vision. So um, this is something that's that continues to grow in importance. We track it, we have metrics and algorithms to see how well we're progressing on this. And one of those uh, examples is uh, the recent installation of solar panels at our headquarter facilities. Uh, so this was you know, you can read the details if you want. Um, what we did, we are going through several phases to continue to get them to be more and more efficient and beneficial. In the end, though, we were able to already reduce operational costs. And um, we, uh, for instance, reduced our carbon dioxide emissions um, and over the next 25 years, uh, anticipate about 18,000 metric tons of a reduction just based on the installation of these solar panels alone. Then we that takes us to our facility here in, in Michigan, where these are our fermentators, where we grow our euglena gracilis. So this is an efficient process, carefully controlled closed system. Uh, we grow the algae in the dark, and that gives us a lot more control over what that algae produces. And so um, this is a system that works really well for us for the application that we're using with the euglena. This is a uh, example of what our finished product looks like. So by the time it's fer fermented, dried down, spray dried, we get a nice tan dry powder. And this is what we sell then to businesses that want to put this into vitamins and supplements. And I have a few examples to show you in just a minute on um, what's out there on the market. The product that we provide is greater than 50% beta glucan, which when you look at some other, you know, for example, supplements that are out there, that's actually a very high concentration. So again, uh, another example of the algae being a very efficient producer of that target molecule. 
it is more than just the beta glucans. So when you look at our ingredient, we do have that greater than 50% of the beta glucans. We also are able to guarantee a certain level of protein, fats, minerals, carotenoids, vitamins. So it really is a powerful superfood that has a, uh, those health benefits that we are looking for. It's been extremely popular on the market. We're uh, excited about the launches we have and we have some other nice, exciting launches uh, on the horizon. Uh, we do sell two versions of our beta via. One is standardized to that 50% beta glucan, and the other one is uh, basically just the paramyelin. So it's standardized to be about 95% of that pure um, 1 3 beta glucan. With that, in the clinical studies that we've done, as well as the animal and in vitro studies, we have enough data to support at least three key ways that the beta glucan is acting regarding immune health. So one, we know it triggers the uh, uh, immune, the, the basically keys, uh, primes key immune cells, so macrophages and dendritic cells get activated, send out signals to recruit the uh, re rest of the immune cells and basically puts the body in a ready state without overstimulating. So it's a really nice daily dose that you can take to get your immune system in a good shape without being overstimulated. We also have some really nice data showing that it can fuel healthy gut bacteria, specifically lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. And then we have some really nice gut integrity data that is so important and all these work together to give people healthy immune systems. We have a series of clinical studies that we've conducted. I just pulled out one to share, uh, was in 25 to 65 year old men and women. They took beta via for 90 days. Uh, we, ha we had them doing daily surveys about their health, uh, an assessment, um, uh, uh, looking at upper respiratory sy symptoms. We also did blood work on day 130 and 90, and we looked at just general safety as well. These were people that were higher up on the exercise level, so 1.5 to 3 hours per day, so that they had a slightly more compromised immune system, but they still were, very, were considered within the healthy adult population. What we saw from that study was super exciting for us. Uh, so this was three fewer re self-reported sick days, 10 fewer upper respiratory tract infection symptom days, 45% fewer episodes, and these are all compared to placebo. And then also 70% fewer uh, symptoms and basically lower severity of those symptoms that they experienced. So really nice, meaningful results from this uh, from this. Uh, study. Uh, we have worked a lot with the material to figure out what does it go into, what does it not go into, how do we make it taste better, how can we uh, like refine the pH and temperature and other things that help with the stability of this ingredient in these different formulations. So just to wrap up, I had a few examples of what's actually out there on the market. So we have um, we have one that was launched called Daily Gyms, which actually they're delicious. They're these little yellow kind of bites, granola bites almost. It's a citrus ginger flavor, chock full of lots of stuff, but you can see here in the ingredient list, it has the beta via complete whole algae uh, calling out the euglena gracilis uh, fermentate. So these are have been out there a, um, over a year and they're doing quite well. People really like those. Um, we also have it in capsule form. So here's two examples. One is from a company called Synergy. Another one is from a company called Aid4. And you can see that they're calling out the beta glucans um, and really starting to grow consumer awareness of how help, help, healthful this, um, this um, particular algae actually is, especially related to immune health. And then finally, we have another one that actually is these little sachets. So you take them and put them into water. And um, again, calling out that beta glucans that's found in beta via along with a vitamin C. This one is also one that has been quite popular. Um, hopefully I haven't run over time. Sorry. Um, okay. And then just to wrap up, uh, we, uh, as I said, work a lot to make sure that we can prove that this works in randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. We publish everything in peer-reviewed journals. We know there's at least three ways that the beta-glucans are working to help with immune health. 
We have a lot of data on safety. It's generally recognized as safe or grass, which is really important in the supplement industry. Um, it's natural. It's got a lot of really nice benefits as uh, you, this whole group is quite aware of. Uh, and then we work really hard to have a high quality and manufacturing set of standards and practices and also a little innovative on some of our new formulations, which we're really excited about some of those that are coming out in the next year or two. So thank you very much. And that was what I wanted to share. Yeah, thank, thank you, Rena, for giving us a big update on, about the chemical industries. I think I, people are already aware about the chemical industries. And I think now today, like you could like show us the how we can use Eglena for mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. human benefit or the animal benefit in the yeah. health. Or something. Good. Yeah. So it's, it's not the only the Eglena we are looking for uh, the research, basic research purpose. We have some lot of practical applications too. Yeah. So yeah. So thank you, Brenda. Uh, let's go for the uh, uh, question and answer sessions. And I think we all, you, all, you all, all are done with the presentation today. And thank you all the presenters who have presented today. And and then let's uh, welcome the questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead with the the question the question box, or you can directly um, ask to the presenters. So there is a question from Thangor. How does the Eglena beta glucan in uh, Eglena supersede that in yeast? Uh, Thangor, is it to, uh, to whom? Uh, it's not very clear. I can answer that related to the immune benefits, if you want. Oh, OK. OK, yeah. so it's for, for the Brenda? OK. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah so, so just to uh, um, uh, buttress my point, the question is, yeah, sure. if if one have an, have the opportunity of using a beta glucan, would you go for the one in Ukraine or the one for yeast? You could pick any without health or anything to kind of buttress the point. Because I know you mentioned uh, that the, uh, the one in yeast has one, three, one, six, something. Yeah, yeah. it's really more of a, a almost a structural um issue so the as you know the beta glucans and the euglena are so accessible but in yeast the beta glucans primarily serve the function to support the cell wall so they are uh, very hard to extract from the cell wall so just getting a consistent uh, yield uh, the yields are much lower I said we get 50 percent beta glucan from our fermentation of the algae uh, the yeast is you know maybe uh, that would be the highest maybe that they would get much lower is what they typically get so it's just harder to get the beta glucan out and then the structure being 1316 when the 13 is really what activates most of the immune cells yeah but in terms of in the absence of uh, quantity for instance um, will they perform but they have, I'm just looking at the, the benefit between both of them. Let's assume quantity is not the issue. You mm -hmm. know, uh, let's assume it takes you, I'm not sure, but it takes you half the time uh, to get Eglina and then twice the time to get that in yeast. So maybe Jeff, do you, you want to, because this has, this is of interest to me. And it's something that again, uh, we, we highlighted in the paper, uh, basically. But I know that, I, I know about the, the cell wall aspect, but I'm now kind of digging deep down into uh, the constituent and the functions, uh, basically, as well as the responses uh, at the maybe mammalian cell level or the uh, biological systems. Sure, yeah. Brenda, do you want me to yeah. expand upon that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, sure. So, Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. So, so there has been a lot of research trying to look at um, yeast beta glucans versus the algae beta glucans, and and certainly yeast has been used for the immune stimulating properties a lot longer than Euglena. The first research was you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but with more of the research that I'm, I'm glad to say we kind of pioneered it, um, we did a lot of side-by-side -side studies mm. of using the pure paramyelin from Euglena versus even the best um, extracts from, from the yeast. And it really does come down to that branching structure. So you know, our beta-glucan from Euglena is this linear, very clean molecule um, and so then the receptor is looking for only about six glucose units. So it's a pretty short segment that's that pattern. Um, so ours would look more like a straight stick 
but the ones from yeast look more like a branching bush. And so, yes, there is one three beta glucan in there, but you have all these side branches that are the one six that are coming off. And so it's a lot harder mechanically for those receptors to actually attach and recognize a very clean section of one three beta glucan. So, um, so that's really the, the basics of why the one three beta glucan from euglena it's superior because it's just a clean surface to be interfacing with, whereas the yeast, it has this inherent bushiness to it uh, that just makes it uh, mechanically difficult for the receptors to interact with it. And I see that. Thank yeah, God okay. I gave a thumbs up. Okay, yeah, thank, right. thank you, Brenda and Jeff, for that. Um, I think that's sure. really uh, very explanatory. Thanks, God. You had, you, had, uh, you had another question, I think. Yeah, so I was going to... Uh, yeah, again, so I was going to ask uh, uh, Brenda, uh, why uh, has, is, are there efforts to look into other species of your uh, iglina uh, beyond the gracilis? Because one thing, again, we're going to be uh, uh, publishing the, actually they just sent me the proof for the position paper, which we'll publish at the end of the year for Iglina International Network. So the idea is to advance conversation around other species beyond but within within your translational uh, effort, has there been something to kind of look at the application of other species beyond uh, Euglena crassilis? Because it looks like it's heavily talked about, but we know from some evidences that other species could have potential applications as well. And actually, I'm going to let Jeff answer that. Uh, he's definitely much more into the R&D and will have a much better answer for you than, than what I could. Sure. Yeah, so our focus has been only on Euglena gracilis, honestly, because um, it's so difficult to demonstrate the safety of some of these new um, species. And so since there's been that historical record of Euglena gracilis, um, and then we did our own grass studies for the safety, um, you can't just go start selling a new species of plant or algae into the marketplace. You have to really make sure it's safe. And I think Mohammed actually had a really nice presentation showing that certain species and even the way that you're growing those algae can have a drastic impact on the metabolites that are produced and those could have negative impacts on animal health or human health. And so um, we really relied upon Euglena gracilis because there had been the history and the literature of its use um, with you know animals. And then we backed that up with, with the safety studies. So I'm, I'm optimistic that as this group continues to do research and investigates really high value potential molecules, I'm optimistic that there'll be new species of euglena that will become commercially available. But those are, uh, it takes a long time commercially. And so we're in the business of doing the commercial side. So once you guys have a good species, then we could start talking about the safety and all the other things to get it commercialized. Okay, thanks Scott. Are you are you okay with the answers? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, there's a question from Dr. Jiang to uh, to Dr. Jiang from Oscar. Uh, so yeah, was there a significant difference in total biomass yield between the standard eglina and the B2 and B3 cell lines? So Jiang, if you are here, uh, yeah, could you reply on this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, basically, you know. Uh, the ratio of the wet biomass to the dry biomass, we see some differences that between the new cell lines and that the white type. The white type, the, per, per, the higher the permalin, uh, the ratio of white type, uh, the dry uh, white biomass to the dry biomass is a, uh, is a lower. That means uh, for example, if we all produce the same amount of white biomass, the uh, final dried biomass, white type, we produce more than the new cell lines. But the new cell lines have such high uh, protein. Therefore, if we optimize the uh, fermentation uh, conditions, then uh, uh, there's some uh, more work to do to investigate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jiang. Uh, at this point, we don't see any other questions. Uh, yes, I do have some questions. 
Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so this, uh, I would like to thank uh, Brenda for presenting the excellent uh, informative uh, presentation. So the question goes to her regarding uh, what is the current uh, market share? Probably, I think it is a little bit tricky. Uh, and also, what is your global market share is the number one. And if possible, what is the total revenue from eCleaner operations from your current operations? Um, yes, that one is a bit tricky. So as far as the market share, uh, I mean, I think one way you could look at it is of the immune health space itself. And um, uh, certainly we've seen a lot of growth over the last uh, two, three years in that space. And I really don't even want to throw out a number uh, because uh, I, I could be way off. And, um, and so we, you know, we, we see the beta glucans from algae growing. So traditionally the yeast beta glucans have taken over most of the, the market share. You see them in some of the uh, pot products that you might be aware of out there, but we do, we are seeing a shift over to the algae. So right now the algae is, well, you know, well under 50% of market share in this space as far as beta glucans. Um, but we'll, you know, we're hoping to see that. And sorry, I don't have a specific number on the, on the total yeah. dollars for you. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And so you, given the uh, formulation that you have between the human nutrition and the animal nutrition, mm -hmm. so which route uh, this uh, product is uh, more uh, uh, given priority by the consumers? Um, so I guess I don't understand the question. So as far the, as the, the, the route, see whether it is, um, uh, focused the people, people, you know, the consumer, uh, acceptance, whether it is from um, uh, human or for the feed. So which one that you see that uh, the product is moving fast? Um, so on the human side of things, those move uh, pretty slow because just it takes a long time for companies to go through all the stability and formulation and bring a product to market. So we have a lot of quick move it, movement in the animal side. I think those usually move faster and we're seeing um, great interest on the animal health side of of the beta glucan use, uh, but like I said, and so it's been slow on the human side. But I'd say in the next year or two, we we have uh, some launches that I think are going to really accelerate what we see on the marketplace. So I, the human side has gone slower, but I think will will be long term quite large. Okay, so uh, if if you see that the animals' uh, nutrition is uh, improving uh, for the market share. So do you feel that it is only because of the cost? It's a low cost product over there, whereas with uh, human nutrition, it is uh, a specialty product. Um, in, for the animals, you know, it really comes down to the cost benefit ratio and Jeff and his team have done a great job of doing a lot of studies showing uh, increased production, better health for the animals, um, and better yield. So that, yes, it's definitely comes down to what, what is the production that you're going to get out. And honestly, that area is also looking for sustainability and solutions that are more long, long lasting and better for the environment. Um, on the human side, it's definitely safety, stability, taste. There's a lot of things that go into success on the human side. Okay. So do you see any market, uh, increased market gap Demand and production. Is it a huge or it is less? I'm sorry, I'm not catching most of what he's saying. Can, is, do you want to uh, So actually, he's trying. He's trying to focus on the market and all the, yeah. all this kind of thing. You know, like yeah, but uh, probably yeah, yes, my have, question is whether if you have, if you are marketing some new product that we would like to know that what is the demand and uh, product. Uh, acceptance you know so sure. this is sure. it because in this in this uh, uh, area that is a very limited uh, people are operating like a come in are some people from japan and then uh, is east asia mm -hmm. but uh, the product that what brenda showed in the presentations are too impressive so 
it is something new. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I think the market opportunity really, it, it really is on the immunity. You need to have some more specific claims. Uh, I think at first, especially with the pandemic, people were happy with just supports immune health, but now you need to show some specific benefits that you're seeing more than just an overarching uh, immune health umbrella claim. Um, and then, the, and then how does the product differentiate? So is sustainability a piece of it? Does it, you know, is it a low, I mean, even specifics, like, is it a low dose? Does it go into, you know, a drink stick and taste okay? And is the cost an a, a, a area that is uh, attractive to consumers? So, so those are, and then natural, non-GMO, gluten-free, all those things are really important. I think the um, algae is, does have some benefits over yeast. I think uh, consumers are moving away from yeast products just because of allergies and things like that. So that's another nice differentiator with the euglena, uh, definitely. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, even though I had too many questions, but uh, because of others, uh, I'm just limiting. Uh, sure. Thank you so much, yeah. uh, Brenda. So if there is a chance that I will talk to you later. Yeah, feel free to reach out and Jeff as well. So we... Um, yeah, we, I think we we will always have some time to connect each other together, like after the conference. The, the um, only reason, I am only afraid that uh, this will not go like another chlorella or spirulina. That's it. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So is there anyone uh, have any questions? Please go ahead. Uh, can I have another question to that uh, gene editing, Jiang? Oh, yes, sure, sure. Jiang, are you here? Jiang, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I'm here, yeah. yeah okay, so, so please go ahead with. Uh, this Jiang is excellent to work that uh, you did with the CRISPR RNP uh, one. Uh, that uh, What is that uh, we are looking at this stage? But already the other question, you talked about the biomass difference in both the cell lines with the wild type, there is some difference. The only issue that uh, what we think, what is the regulatory issue uh, connected with a genome edited lines? So this, <laughs> uh, this is very important at this point because we are not clear whether these products will be approved or not. Ah, uh, yeah. The I only can talk uh, from the genetic <laughs> point of view, because as we see genetically, only six base pairs deleted from new cell lines, then the dramatically changed the, the phenotype, uh, changed the products. Then, and therefore, scientifically, we see, because we don't have any foreign genetic elements introduced into the new cell line, there are, therefore they are not, not GMO. It's okay. gene edited, but it's very similar as the natural variation. Have not, nothing uh, foreign introduced into yeah. the cell lines. See, that, that, that is clearly understood because on the gene editing that uh, you mentioned that you have not changed anything, you have not introduced anything from outside. Okay, so the only point that remains is that this is a debating issue whether the yeah, edited genome uh, is a GMO or a non GMO, whether it is acceptable for public use. So, yeah. this is one issue. Uh, yeah, in USA, under the uh, 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 announcement of USDA, also the Chinese government, Japanese, some uh, agent, also the uh, uh, Canadian food. Uh, and agriculture uh, of Canada, and uh, they they don't regulate uh, the gene editing products as long as they are not uh, to produce pests. So the other side of the uh, globe, I think uh, it is banned, right? Like Europe and yeah. other countries, that uh, majority of the algae consuming people. So yeah. this is a major concern. Yeah, some countries are more uh, restricted, that's for sure. In European countries are possibly more uh, careful. To so do, do you foresee any fast improvement in this scenario? My uh, can you translate for me? Uh, What's the question? Yeah, so, uh, is the question is like how we like how quickly you can improve this scenario or? Yeah, how like quickly maybe. whether the, the gene edited uh, microalgae can be used for public, how far it is. Oh, how, how quick. 
Uh, so what would be the future like future i think uh, i think uh, i think currently uh, future for micro yeah. algae for even agriculture it is only few countries it is uh, uh, yeah as said but uh, many countries still it is under uh, regulation yeah yeah, yeah I, i think the uh, gmo uh, uh, topic is uh, 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 would be a topic for ever yeah? but you know many products are uh, released and approved especially by the big agricultural countries and uh, i think the, the, the uh, for food the, the would be uh, more uh, restrict and more, more careful we cannot predict the exact uh, the time uh, frame but uh, i'm very optimistic because uh, the, the uh, not only the government and the agency also scientists have the uh, evidence that the gene editing Uh, products uh, are very similar to the traditional of uh, uh, breeding uh, uh, products. Okay, what is the perspective of the FDA in this case? What's the uh, yeah? So, is there any regulations uh, from the FDA about the yeah. FDA? Oh, FDA for G editing. If you know, uh, if you know, G editing has two parts, two two uh, two approaches. Uh, one is a uh, knockout to delete some. Uh, elements, genetic elements from the genome. Why is not in? Now here is to introduce uh, some uh, uh, elements, but uh, that elements could be from uh, endogenous, could be from a foreign source. If from endogenous, that would be an uh, area is closer to the knockout. For the knockout, as I know, the FDA doesn't have a regulation for the gene edited products, as long as your products is not to produce any pests. If you only produce anything similar as traditional breeding products, is not regulated. And the, this announcement was released by the USDA and uh, four years ago. Okay. Okay. So just for your information, we have one minute left. From we are actually within yeah. the time, and there are a lot of people they want to move out. They yeah. Have, they have other other jobs. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah, so we'd like to thank everyone uh, for uh, asking a lot of questions, important questions. Um, there was a good discussion about, about all those uh, questions as well. And thank you all for the presenters who have presented today. And thank you all for coming today. And it's almost time to wrap up. So before uh, leaving, I will thank everyone. Thank you, EIM. Uh, thank you, Noble Jim. Thank you, Kamin. Thank you, all the participants from throughout the world. and then i will pass it to the to scott and see you again in the next conference scott thank you mafazer and thank you for all the speakers again um thought i'd shed a little bit of stats for for everybody on the call today just to show you um how much we've grown in the last year so we've had 24 unique speakers that this year from spanning the globe we already told you about how much of an international presence we have Um, I think there were over 14 different countries represented um, at the conference. Um, we had 150 unique registrants at the conference this year, so that is uh, that's much improved from last year. Um, so it, it just goes to show you how much uh, the 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 network is growing, um, and we'll we'll keep it up with years to come. Um, I'd like to echo the comments from Mafazer. I'd like to thank. Um, everybody from speakers participants sponsors both Kemen and Noble Gen uh, and in particular the conference organization committee uh, it takes a lot of work to put these things together and I'd like to send some uh, targeted thanks out to uh, Katie um, Horlock Roberts from Noble Gen assisted with uh, all manner of different things and really was um, a key uh, component of putting this conference together. So thank you very much, Katie. Uh, Zubi Azima for IT support um, um, throughout all of this. Uh, we have another person, uh, Steve Barlow. Uh, he also helped with IT and the website design and putting up the conference details on the website. And John Holmes for uh, all the help with the promotional posters that um, you may have seen uh, circulating um, across LinkedIn and other social media platforms. I'd like to also thank uh, John Knight uh, for his assistance and contributions to the EIN uh, and also the EIN Science Committee and Executive Committees. Um, I'd like to just quickly pass it over to 
um, Dr. Uh, Vladimir Hempel, who is going to give us a brief update about uh, next year's conference. So over to you, Vlad. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, so I'll already put uh, in a chat uh, data, my contact details, so email and links to the institute and uh, to my institute contacts. Uh, so the plan that we agreed on the day before yesterday, I, I believe, is to organize the next meeting in a hybrid form. So for those participants who would like to join in person, uh, we have chosen the dates uh, 17 and uh, 18 of uh, July. It should be right after a large European Congress of Protestology held in Vienna. So the idea is that some participants from Vienna could uh, join in person uh, in Prague. The connection between Vienna and Prague by train, for example, is uh, very convenient. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it will be hybrid. So of course there will be also a possibility to join online. And uh, uh, we will organize it together uh, with uh, Dr. Anna Kankowska from University of Warsaw. And I, I'm now checking the details, uh, availabilities and such. And hopefully we will set up a, a web page in January and information will come. So please set the, uh, like, What's uh, what yeah. that? Save the date. Save the dates. Save the dates. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Save the dates. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I'm not hundred percent. Well, it still may change because I didn't check all the. I didn't make the bookings, uh, but I hope uh, it's summer, so it should be like free and available. So yeah. save the dates for now and more info in January. So, uh, Lana, just to also add, if there are. Uh, apart from um, uh, Anna Kokoska in Poland, if there are also other partners uh, on the call that wish to, that may want to join to co-organize, that would also help, for instance. I know um, this one, Nobogen and, and, and Kemin and Iglia Network did. Then last year it was Iglia Network, uh, LM Institutes in Manchester and Nobogen. So if there are other people, so maybe uh, Jeff, you might, reach out to uh, Scott if you guys want to get involved uh, as well. Yeah. You may reach yeah, out definitely, to uh, Yeah, Definitely, everybody's welcome. Uh, I think I'll be in touch with Scott after to get some info from him and uh, feedback and and help. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think he has, so many, he has so many of the default things on all of the program and things. So we can just look at where we need to improve on, on uh, quite a lot of things as well and you can also use the website we can give you the, the login details i think scott has all of those things uh except if you want to build a new website from scratch where you can just clone we can just create a page and then it's cloned or scott can give you all of those details you can arrange with him he can give you all of those details really okay okay thank you yeah i think we will use it and no particularly problem. yeah I, I would like to mention that i'm from academia so uh it's relatively easy to you know, build the program from this side, but uh, I don't know the industrial part and application uh, applied research very much. So I'll appreciate help. Yeah, I think that is why we need an industry co or industry co sponsor. So, uh, Jeff and Scott, this is where you guys come in, uh, which was why I raised that point initially. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd also just like to send a reminder out to people to please fill out the conference feedback form uh, just so we can continuously improve each year. And then I'd also like to just send a, a really quick update. Um, the hope is to um, publish these presentations in, in, in an issue or in a journal article in a manuscript format. So we'll be reaching out to um, presenters in, in the coming weeks um, to try to uh, put something together. Uh, for that purpose um, but we look forward to that um, and, and what we're able to to publish uh, as a community um, any other things you want to add thank god or um, should we wrap up
Yeah, that's all from me. Please wrap up. We'll, we'll, we'll be hearing from LADA. And just to mention that the uh, lab, LADA will be organizing the conference for 2023. Then 2024, uh, Masami Nakazawa uh, will work with uh, Ishikawa uh, to organize the work, to organize for 2024 in Japan, Tokyo. And uh, uh, Rob Field has agreed to organize 2025 in Manchester. So we kind of have those three covered, right? So that's just it for me, please. Okay, great. Well, with that, I'm just going to conclude the conference. Um, thanks again to everybody for attending. And we look forward to gathering again, uh, hopefully in the summer. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, stay well. Great work. Thank you. Yeah, have a Bye. great day. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.